The Timberwolves want to substitute a dog. What are they, nuts? Dog's a registered member of the team. He practices with the team. He travels with the team. You check in your rule book, but you won't find anything that says a dog can't play. He's right. Ain't no rule says a dog can't play basketball. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide. My name is William Bibiani. <laughs> I am a film critic, and everybody calls me Bibbs. I like that. I like our catchphrase now. Yeah. The high- I-, I imagine, like, a face collapsing in on itself. <laughs> just the top part of the head. The top part of the head. Just, like, just like, collapsing in. <laughs> like, it did, like a cartoon character ate a lemon. It, like, like, like that roach face effect from A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, where her face just sort of folds in on itself and she becomes a cockroach. Gross. That's this podcast. Thanks. I'm Whitney Seibold, <laughs> the one who says gross things. Well done. I'm a film critic for various outlets around, and I'm the co-host of Cancel Too Soon. Yeah, the other podcast we do. The other podcast, we have several. Uh, we have two. Well, we have two. <laughs> we have this one and the other one. And we have one that's defunct, so that constitutes several. Uh, we had several. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, now we're just this. Uh, and the other. And the other. Moving on. Hey, everybody. We're back. <laughs> It's Sunday, and uh, we hope you had, if, you're, if you celebrate Thanksgiving, we hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you ate yourself silly. What did you do for Thanksgiving? Uh, I saw my family, and I really? had three large meals. With That's a lot of meals. Various, I had uh, breakfast with my dad and his wife. Hmm. I had lunch with my aunt and that segment of the family. And uh, uh, my wife was able to put together a very nice dinner, which That's I had nice. with her and my son. That's great. Yeah, we had, uh, <laughs> we had, we had dinner here uh, Michelle, my wife, uh, uh, mm. went all out. She really wanted to do something super special for our moms. We brought them over, and it was a very, very nice time. Mm. And uh, I am thankful for the family that we have uh, in our presence, and I am thankful for our internet family as well. So thank everybody for listening. I'm thankful for every single one of you intelligent bastards. Can I call, <laughs> them, re- can I call them intelligent bastards, or is that a little insulting? It's a little insulting. Okay. I- I apologize for calling you bastards. There you go. But you are intelligent. Super intelligent. We love you dearly. We Whitney said bastards with the absolute it, utmost it, of affection. It, it is the most loving way to call somebody a bastard. Like there you, you magnificent bastard. There you go. Like a like a. Can we say bastard some more? <laughs> sure. Why not? Just let's just be Patton. Um, <laughs> I read your book. This week on Critically Acclaimed, uh, we are going to be reviewing uh, by request, because uh, the majority of our, our content is curated via poll on the Schmoville Facebook page. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of November, we said, hey, the last week of every month, we're going to review an entire movie franchise. And for the first one, mm-hmm. you picked Air Bud. And it was a runaway. Oh, yeah. Like, people really wanted us to review Air Bud. I, so, think, I think Highlander was second, but it had like a tenth of the votes of Air Bud. I don't know if it was so, a tenth, yeah. but it was insane. Like, people mm. were just like, ooh, Air Bud. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be reviewing that at the back half of the episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are also going to uh, be reviewing some new releases that came out this week. Uh, we're going to be reviewing Pixar's Coco, uh, mm-hmm. The Man Who Invented Christmas, starring Dan Stevens. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be reviewing the new Oscar bait movie, Darkest Hour, starring Gary Oldman. As Winston Churchill. As Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. Nicely done. So let's get, listen, let's get started on the new releases right now. Of course. Uh, we're going to because remind why, everybody that... Uh, why make you wait? We, we review films on a scale of C- minus to C+, plus, with C+, plus as good as it gets, and C- minus as bad as it gets. <laughs> I, I love that no matter what we give, it sounds like every film is completely mediocre. Yeah. I toyed with the idea of maybe pushing to like have a rate on a scale of A+, plus to A-, minus because we're critically acclaimed, but uh, it felt like selling out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that I feel like that's the way a lot of reviews are, especially in like the the video game segment of mm-hmm. the reviewing like populace. A seven is the worst you can give. A yeah, video yeah. Game. Like, yeah. like if, if you give it a nine point one, that's somehow a negative review. I reviewed a uh, like I think it was like Halo Reach for a website once, and I think I gave it like an eight something, like an eight point something. That's a I, positive review. It was a very that's positive like a review, plus, yeah. and, and people were furious <laughs> that it wasn't higher. You would have thought I had like killed their pet. Like it was just mean. <laughs> Like I'm just like, look, there is some minor issues with the with the single player campaign. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, um, please, 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 I'm just being honest. Stop hitting me. Listen, the big release is actually one I haven't seen okay. because uh, uh, I, I'm scheduling. a failure. Well, it, it is a holiday weekend, indeed. But I didn't get to see Coco. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are are going to see Coco. Mm-hmm. Tell me about Coco. Uh, Coco is the latest from Pixar. Uh, it, it is a an animated film. It also comes with. First of all, I want to uh, review the short. That comes with Coco because it's, like it's frozen short because it's long. 
Well, how, how? Why is that so terrible? Everyone keeps saying about how long it is. Why? why because why is it it's also bad. Ah. That's the problem. Um, they throw in a lot of songs. It's essentially a miniature Frozen musical, and mm-hmm. it takes place at Christmas time. And we learn that. Anna and Elsa, the characters from Frozen, uh, don't have any traditions because they were separated as children, as illustrated from the movie Frozen. Yeah, Elsa spent the, uh, most of her time uh, uh, locked in her room, yeah. afraid to and, see the And world. so they didn't celebrate Christmas together ever. Uh, yeah. But the obnoxious living snowman, Olaf, <laughs> uh, <laughs> who is only slightly better than that creature from uh, Jack Frost... The killer snowman Jack Frost, not oh. the Michael Keaton Jack Frost. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's not better than I, I, the Michael th- Keaton Jack Frost? I'd say they're all on, all on a matrix together, but mm. okay. Uh, he decides to go out into the, the world, into their country, and see how the various people celebrate the holidays and c- accumulate their traditions. Okay. And bring them back and say, hey, here's some traditions you can choose, pick and choose. Christmas Town? Yeah, pretty much. Hmm. And he doesn't know what Christmas is. He doesn't know anything about traditions. Uh, there are, there are Christ, Christian, Christ, Christian families who are celebrating Christmas. There are Jewish families celebrating Hanukkah. There are just various family traditions all across the gamut in all this right. little Norwegian town. You're making it sound relatively harmless. It's relatively harmless, but I hate Ol- Olaf. I hate the character. He's just... <laughs> Josh Gad is fine. He's a fine actor, but yeah, just the funny animal sidekick characters from any Disney film is going to be like the most disposable part. And now he's like the star of the show. Right. So I don't want to spend a lot of time focusing on him. Plus, my viewing of this film was colored by an article I read recently how there's actually a really weird undercurrent of what's called vor fetish. Yeah. Attached to the Frozen characters. Yeah, there's a lot of that, yeah. Um, vor fetish, look it up. But uh, the, I, I came upon, upon this article that des- described uh, Elsa as having the ability to essentially like puke up soft serve. And this was like a really common thing. Huh. Like Elsa with her freezing Iceman powers is also able to puke up soft serve. Kind of makes sense. Are you sure? I mean, and, she's got ice people, powers. And people I have guess. done like these Photoshop images of Elsa like barfing soft serve into a cone and handing it over to her sister who would then eat it. That's very strange. It's very strange. Hmm. I, I don't quite understand it, but yeah. it's it's a whole subculture. To eat your own. To, <laughs> to eat your own, in fact. Oh, okay. Um, so when I was watching this short, that's all I could think, and the two characters are talking, and I expected Elsa at any point just to go, Bleh! and start puking up ice cream. And that's more you it. than the, that's not the movie's I, fault. No, it's not okay. the movie's fault. The movie is, is just obnoxious and innocuous in a, in a Well, is it, is it not funny? Way. Are the songs bad? Like, the, what the, is it, what's, song, that, what's wrong with it? The, I mean, so, like, the songs are kind of forgettable. It's just usual Disney pap. You know, there's not a lot of texture or character or personality to it. It's just sort of, here's the characters you love doing the same thing again. Ah. Only now it's Christmas. So it's the frozen Christmas fun. Great. Um, you know, yeah. D- D- Disney sands off edges. It's what they do. So not that Frozen had any edge to begin with. <laughs> yeah, Frozen had some edge to it. Frozen has some subtext. There's some subtext. Enjoy the subtext. Fro- Tangled is so much better. Um, <laughs> anyway. That's that. Mm. After you've waited through 20 minutes of previews and 15 minutes of film, you finally get to Coco, and Coco is actually quite a good film. Uh, Coco takes place in Mexico, and it surrounds uh, the Mexican traditions surrounding the Day of the Dead, uh, and including the, the Calivaras and putting up portraits of your family in a big shrine, giving offerings to your family, and on the Day of the Dead, that's when they can come visit you and sort of check you out and make sure you're doing okay. The living can't see the dead, but the dead can see the living. And it's right. sort of like keeping the family traditions alive, making sure the whole family, even those that have passed on, are in the room with you. The The young hero, Miguel, has a very large family, and his great-great-grandfather was once ostracized from the family for being a musician, and ever since, the entire family has been shoemakers. He, however, wants to be a musician, and he is forbidden by his abuela. His, his, grand, his grandmother won't let him. This is kind of the plot of Book of Life. Yes, it is. Right now, I was fine. <laughs> I was fine. Listen, this movie came out a couple of years ago. An animated uh-huh. movie. I think it was from, from Fox or DreamWorks. And it was about the Day of the Dead. Mm-hmm. It's called The Book of Life. And it was about a, uh, a a young man whose father wanted him to be a matador, but he wanted to be a mariachi. 
And that led to a whole bunch of problems. And then the Day of the Dead came along, mm. and he ended up dying and going into the afterlife to mm. find someone. And uh, I was fine with there just being two animated films about the Day of the Dead, but the musician thing's pretty on the nose. Yeah. Now, to be fair, it, it banks entirely on... It's not like some sort of softened version of these Mexican traditions. It's the Mexican traditions. Okay. It's not like a, a high-octane version of it or anything. But uh, young Miguel ends up stealing a guitar from a grave, Ooh. which curses his family and gets him essentially sucked into the afterlife as a living person. Okay. So he's in the afterlife, but he's not dead. He can only return to the afterlife with the blessing of the family members that are there, but they were all shoemakers and they still hate musicians. So he has to find this missing, mysterious, ostracized great-great-grandfather who's also in the land of the dead, who he suspects is like a, a really hard-to-reach uh, old Mexican movie star. Okay. And, and he meets wacky things along the way, and there's spirit guide animals that are like these big, glowing, badass creatures. You've probably seen that winged... Uh, saber tooth cat on some of the posters. Yeah, that looks like something out of a Leica film. It looks cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, because this is Pixar, and because we're dealing with family and memory and death and remembering your loved ones that have passed on, you are definitely going to cry. Right. At least twice. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, it, I'm already it's, sad. Well, but you know the way Pixar makes you sad. It makes you sad in a really great way. Oh. And uh, they are just so good at that they're so good at this the skill of getting under your skin and making you cry and finding that one sentimental soft spot um this isn't necessarily as com- like emotionally complex as something like inside out which or, was literally about emotional complexity yeah. <laughs> so like, that's kind of a high bar uh, yeah i guess I, I think inside out is still pixar's best movie um but it's a you know it's it's them finally at doing at their A game again you know yeah. after a while a lot of people suspected that Pixar wasn't going to be doing it anymore because they did Cars three and the Good Dinosaur and there's like various tiers of Pixar we, quality we now. We set the bar so, so high for Pixar. And they set the bar hard well, for themselves. They did, but seriously, like we we shouldn't have bought into that. It was an unrealistic standard. Mm-hmm. Pixar had such a run. For mm-hmm. so long, like we're like for the like, there was a while where the worst movie they did was a Bug's Life, which was still pretty good. Yeah, like, and everyone was just like, they can do no wrong. <laughs> we're gonna back this horse forever. They're gonna make brilliant movies every single time forever until the world ends. Yeah. And then they started making some ones that were just okay. Yeah, and like, then, okay, Cars and Two, Brave. Cars, they made a couple yeah. that were actually like legit bad. I think yeah. after all, I think Cars Two is. Not a very good movie. I, I, I like Brave more than most, but it's not great. Mm-hmm. And but Brave is, is a mess. It's, I think Brave. Really mess, I think yeah. Brave is a victim of advertising. If people were ready for the exact opposite of what that movie was, mm-hmm. and they really should have just told them, "This is a story about a mother and a daughter, and one of them turns into a bear." Mm-hmm. If they had just told you that from the <laughs> and, beginning, and, and people would have been fine with it. I think it's, it's like taking the empowered princess fantasy and adding farcical elements. They should have sold it that way. They but, really yeah. should have told you what it was. Mm. They they made everyone think it was Braveheart with a female protagonist and animated by Pixar, which sounds awesome. <laughs> and they did had no intention of doing that, and that is mm. bullshit. And a lot of people like the character, even though the movie's yeah. not very good. Uh, I, Mer- I, Mer- Merida, I stand by. I stand by. I think yeah. that in its in its own context, I think but, the movie's uh, pretty good. But my point is, is that you know we we put Pixar on a pedestal, and the pedestal long since wobbled. <laughs> and uh, and obviously there are things going on behind the scenes at Disney which are uh, throwing a bit of a pall over Coco and mm. I don't know a lot about it I just know what I've read and I know you know what you've read and mm. we've had this conversation before but you know the movie is the movie and it sounds like it's a good one it, it is a good one it, it's directed by Lee Unkrich who's done a couple of the uh, Pixar's in the past yeah uh, so he's experienced in this he's chosen a really c- just like in the book of life just like in Corpse Bride the land of the dead is an exciting colorful place that is, you know, towering towers and billions of people and bright colors and a lot of energy. There's there's always more life in the land of the dead yeah. in these movies than there is in the land of the living. Not entirely sure that's the best message yeah, in yeah. some respects. Yeah, remember Corpse Bride where the land of the living is literally in black and white? Yeah, it's boring, <laughs> actually. Like, I rewatched Corpse Bride not that long yeah. ago. It is not... Well, that I, whole bit's not fun. I, 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 it's not fun. I totally dig Corpse Bride. I think it's it's a very very Tim Burton of Tim Burton movies. I don't think it quite works, but okay. Uh, you know, and she turns into butterflies. Uh, but uh, 
but yeah, it, it's it still has that same sort of magic. It still really kind of wraps you up. It has you know just good characters and good pace and uh, fantastic representation. Uh, which is something a lot of people were really kind of aching for. Yeah. We had the Book of Life, but we don't have a lot of kid films from a, a Latinx perspective. And how great to have one! Um, there more. Are a, a lot of we've had we've had them before, but how great to have more? Ha, ha, to have more of them, just yeah. to, to get more, especially on this level of like release mm. and, a, and a release, and a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of my Latin friends locally have been looking for the Spanish dubbed versions, which you can find in certain theaters around at least Los Angeles. I don't know if it's nationwide. Mm-hmm. But uh, evidently, if you go see it in Spanish, it's even better because okay. it does take place in Mexico, but the characters all speak English. Right. Uh, but if there, you can find a Spanish dubbed version when it comes out on video. Surely you can watch a Spanish language track and get the full experience of these Mexican traditions. Yeah. Uh, so it's doing a lot of great things, and it's also a really good movie. I can't really say a lot bad about Coco. Great. Well, awesome. I'm, I I look forward to seeing mm. it, and I will. Mm. My life is complicated. <laughs> uh, but I did. I was able to see Darkest you, you, Hour. You sound like you have like three families or something. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I here? Uh, no, it's just, it's a busy time for everybody. Yeah, well, I, I feel terrible. I've been slacking off. Well, it, it, it's also the holiday season for us yeah. critics, which means uh, we, we belong to uh, screener lists. We get screeners in the mail. Yeah, we have a lot of catching up and to do. And we have a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. So there's like literally a pot, literally a pile like yeah. a heap of screeners in my house that I needed to get through. So we're catching up. Well, we uh, we did see Darkest Hour, which is a new mm. film in... Um, I think a lot of people use this term derogatively. I just consider it a genre. Mm. It's the Oscar bait genre. It's, it's a, bio, it's a biographical is, film set during World War II mm. uh, with but, bravura from, performances and lots of melodrama. And and uh, directed by Joe Wright, who runs in this circle. Oh, yeah. He <laughs> like, directed like this, Atonement and yeah. Anna Karenina and Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Um, I didn't like his Anna Karenina, I I, but I did like his. I liked his Pride and Prejudice. And I, I admired like it totally. what he did visually with Anna Karenina. Mm-hmm. I don't think it matched the material, but it was certainly interesting, and I would tell I someone know. to check it out. I want him to do more like Hannah, frankly. I still haven't seen. That's the one I haven't seen. I haven't <laughs> oh, okay. seen Hannah. Um, so uh, yeah, Joe Wright has kind of his finger on the pulse of sort of the Academy's wavelength. I mm-hmm. think, and I, when I say that, I just mean the Academy has up, up until recently, at least. I know they've been working to change the demographic. Mm-hmm. Been a very particularly you know sort of an older demographic. You know the more mm-hmm. of a baby boomer and older demographic, and yeah. the movies sort of appeal to that mindset. So, a, bi- a biographical film about Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain uh, during World War II, really just hammers that <laughs> real hard. Just like it's just pushing that button, uh-huh. just pushing that button, and. You know, on some regards, in, in a lot of respects, it's it's that film. It uh, begins the day before Winston Churchill is uh, uh, brought in to be the new prime minister mm. uh, after the old one failed. Uh, and yeah, Neville Chamberlain. Yeah, and then it takes place over the course of a little more than a month. Um, as a lot of political pressure was put on Winston Churchill to find a way to make nice with the Nazis in Mm. order to make sure Britain didn't have to go to war. And I'll give the movie some credit. They do focus really hard on the idea that World War I was not that long ago at the time, yeah. and people just didn't want to go to war again, and there was a, and that was an understandable sentiment. Well, but there was the, also, like, the basically, of, this isolationism mm-hmm. of, well, yeah, but that's happening over there. That's across the channel. So yeah. who cares? Well, also, the notion that... Uh, we don't want to go to war, not just because we were at war, but because we believe in peace. We're not a war-faring nation. Mm -hmm. But that's difficult to do when you have tanks rolling through France. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this this basically takes you from the day before Winston Churchill is is made prime minister to the Battle of Dunkirk, which if you saw the movie Dunkirk, and mm-hmm. you probably did, it did very well at the box office, <laughs> this is kind of like, you could probably intercut them pretty well. I was, I was actually thinking, as I le- like Darkest Hour is uh, 125 minutes, and mm-hmm. Dunkirk's pretty short, it's like 100 minutes. They're better thereabouts. And I think you could edit those two films together into one bloody great war epic. It would probably be pretty cool. Where you had just another perspective in Dunkirk, and it was Churchill's perspective. Right. It would be interesting to see how that worked. It'd certainly be an experiment. I don't know if it would actually function, Mm -hmm. but it'd be a neat idea. But, uh, you know, the Battle of Dunkirk, uh, all of the uh, British forces were basically shoved uh, onto uh, Northern Beach in France, Mm -hmm. and the Nazis were... 
c- closing in, <laughs> closing on in. all sides, uh, and there was seemed like escape was impossible. And then they they lost they launched a, a last ditch effort to use civilian vessels to rescue mm-hmm. the British soldiers. And you really get a lot more context in Darkest Hour in terms of like, no, seriously, this is all our soldiers. <laughs> if we don't get them off that beach, we're just going to lose the war anyway. So maybe you know, finding a way to make nice with Hitler isn't so bad and Winston Churchill who was an outsized personality like mm. times 10 <laughs> uh, was vehemently anti just mm. against that and he refused to compromise and what the darkest hour is about is this one period where his resolve was really tested and he really was almost tempted mm. just to, to, to actually like enter peace talks with Hitler he, exactly which of course would have been and, and you know the who, end of the world and, possibly and the moderator was supposed to be Benito Mussolini <laughs> yeah which is just which insane the, yeah. To think about, so so you got this movie, which is on one hand beautifully technically crafted. It's really well yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah, it's, the photography is awesome. All of the performances are fantastic. Uh, Gary Oldman is going to be an Oscar front runner for this, for better or worse. But it's yeah. really just one of those big performances. About a fifth of the performance feels like some sort of broad impersonation of Winston Churchill, but. I was surprised at how much of his performance felt like it was actually Winston Churchill. And, and based on the everything- makeup, you know, like they put him in that sort of big baby face makeup. You uh-huh. know, Ch- nobody looks like Churchill. That's the yeah. problem. Yeah. And from certain angles, he looked a little bit like uh, Anthony Hopkins in Hitchcock. Yeah. Where they, they tried to give him sort of the same profile, but you could still see Gary Oldman's face under it. But for the most part, it did work. It was very good makeup. I, I think so. About eighty percent of the time. And I think the, even the bigness of the performance. Again, Winston Churchill was a big personality mm. in real life. Uh, so I, I, I bought it mm. the entire way through. So the performances are great. It's shot very, very, very well. Mm. But it's also the kind of story that's a little easier to tell with hindsight. And what we've got in Darkest Hour is a story that, uh, and a filmmaker, I think, or certainly a film that really reveres Churchill Mm -hmm. a lot. There's a lot of hero worship here. There's a lot of great man mentality, which if you've, uh, I I don't, I assume they still talk about this in college. It's been a while since I've been in college. The great great man genre. Yeah. Well, just the great man argument Mm -hmm. is actually really, was always really frowned upon in in, in all my history classes. The Mm -hmm. idea of, you know, you're going to do a paper, you're going to do a paper on a historical figure. Don't make it sound like they did it all on their own Mm -hmm. because life doesn't work that way. And And movies tend to work that way. You look at history and you begin to see how, how many instances there are of, well, if it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. Right. Like, to do that same thing. It just happened to be that person. Or that person happened to be the figurehead, and there were mm. a lot of people underneath them, or mm. there was just it was just more complicated than that. And this movie tries to address various things that Churchill did do wrong, at least mm. before these events. But they're always couched yeah. in the terms of, this went wrong, the Battle of Gallipoli, everything, you did, you did all this terribly. And Churchill says, well, it would have worked if they listened to me. Yeah. And the movie yeah, kind of yeah. lets that slide, lets him have also, the last word the entire time, which is there was a little a, frustrating. There's a scene early on, actually, where uh, Kristen Stott, Scott Thomas, who plays his wife, actually has a really telling speech about how he has actively neglected his family mm. in order to be a politician. And he makes no Apologies for that, and the family is totally okay with that. Mm, that's their and lot. Yeah, that they understand that's their lot, and they understand that's not really cool, not for them. Mm-hmm. And everybody's really uncomfortable. But Churchill, he realizes, you know, but that's what I did. I can't apologize now. I made my choices. Yeah. So it, it just sort of openly says, also he was a bastard. Yeah. And Churchill says, yes. I was a bastard. Right. And there's nothing I can say about that because I was. And I think the film was a little bit responsible in including that scene. I think it's responsible in including that scene. I just think Mm. the overall tone is basically, and thank God he did those terrible things because it made him who he is. The final scene where he gets a standing ovation was Mm. not exactly lightly touched. It was not subtle. It was not subtle. It's a speech you hear in Dunkirk, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and, there's and, no spoilers here. It's mm. history. You should you should know the gist of it. <laughs> like um, I said, you should you need to cut this movie with Dunkirk. Yeah, um, but I will say this: even though I think uh, ultimately its perspective is a little simplistic, um, I it's it's rousing. You know, it's a really yeah. satisfying oh, yeah. drama. And at the end, I felt. Uh, uh, very inspired, and I really, you know, felt like, yeah, maybe we can all rally together and do some good in the world. You know, I think yeah, that's a, that's the power of a great orator. And and uh, in fact, there's a great scene where uh, he he says something somebody doesn't understand, and he just screams the word Cicero and storms out of the room. <laughs> Ah, another great orator. Yes, just invoking his name. He doesn't say quote Cicero. He just says Cicero. <laughs> 
Uh, for a film that takes place mostly in boardrooms and is held entirely in conversation, there's a lot like of a, smoky offices, a lot of cigars. Uh, there's there's a maybe a shot or two of the front or like planes flying overhead, but it's yeah. mostly just discussion, and it feels really really exciting. Mm, yeah, uh, Joe Wright because everything bring is on the a line. lot of energy to his direction. He has a, a kind of uh, directorial flair that is actually very watchable, even in his bad movies. Mm. So. Yeah, it's, it's actually really exciting to watch, but it does feel like common ground. We're not getting a new perspective on Churchill. We're just getting the Brits' view of Churchill, which is a very glowing one. Yeah. And that makes it a little less than what it could have been, I think. Yeah. I, I, I think by maybe layering on a little bit more of what Churchill was or what kind of person he was, that would have been great. Like, make it a little bit more personal. Mm-hmm. But again, Churchill wasn't really a personal guy. He's British. <laughs> I think that's part of the point, is that yeah. everybody's very guarded. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult to get kind of into the nitty gritty. So my favorite scene was actually where he does get personal, and he talks to the people. Oh, there's uh, a great bit. I'm not going to ruin it I don't want to ruin it because it. it's the climax of the movie, there's but he a, talks There's to the a really people, good point yeah. where he's, he's not just talking to politicians for a change, and it's a great scene. Yeah. It's a great scene. You can tell like whenever they came up with that bullet point or they found that historical anecdote, mm. they realize now we have a movie. Or even if it's fictionalized, I don't care. It's I don't actually care. just a great scene. It's a great yeah. fucking scene. <laughs> there's a lot of really good stuff in it. Like, I recommend this movie, but it's one of those movies that... Uh, <sighs> When it comes to historical dramas, a lot of people experience a mm. lot of history for the first time through yeah. movies or television. Especially you know, like young people yeah. or like still in high school, they don't yeah. know the they haven't taken the class yet. Yeah, they haven't taken the class yet, haven't read a lot, or or you know, maybe it's a little outside their culture, you don't know British history as well as you know American history, and that that's understandable. You gotta learn about it somewhere. I, I think there's a danger of uh, getting your history from historical movies. Mm. And I don't think it's necessarily the worst danger in the world, but it's the sort of thing where if you're interested in the history of something, make sure you don't let your interest end at the movie. Yeah, yeah. Like, actually read about it a little bit. Look up some articles, you know. Don't, get a book, please, by all means. Don't but learn like, about Pompeii from the movie Pompeii. Oh, God. <laughs> like, no, you're barely even getting the gist of it. Like, you're just like, no, like, even even like respected movies mm. are not actually great history. They conflate a lot of things. Mm. They change a lot of things in order to make it work dramatically. I had a... Um, I had a screenwriting professor in college who said one of the tricks when you're doing a story based on the real life, mm. because you can't copyright it. Like, if you did, like, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to write a, uh, a movie about the life of George Washington. Mm. No one owns that. <laughs> Anyone, you, you could be competing with five other great George Washington scripts that are out there for all you know. Mm. So one of the tricks that my professor said was you put in three small lies. Okay, because to, the, to make sure that that's yours. Just to make sure that's yours. So if you see that exact lie in mm. another script, you know they ripped you off. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if they you don't see it, they just also told a George Washington story. So like even in good ones, you'll notice there are certain things that are fudged. Mm. Um, so yeah, if if you're interested in Dunkirk, if you're interested in Darkest Hour, watch them together. I think they complement each other very very well. But you know, read historians mm. and and find out the actual truth behind the matter as much as anyone knows anyway. But, this and a, this and World War II is one of the most documented historical events in history. There's no <laughs> yeah, shortage yeah. of information. In fact, this is the third film just this year about the British perspective of World War II. Right. Because there was uh, Darkest Hour, there's Dunkirk, and there's Their Finest, yeah. which is about sort of the, the British propaganda film machine. Mm. And, and quite a good film, actually. Um, kind of flew under I, I the radar. It came out in like April or something. Yeah, right? it was yeah. earlier in the year, but it, yeah. it is this year. And I'm, I'm wondering what it, what it is about this current crux in history that we're getting all of these British World War II films. Well, we never stopped getting World War II. Films. We never stopped, but three notable one, three films denotes a trend. Yeah, it's been a trend for a long time. <laughs> You're going to find... Okay, whatever. We're getting off on a no chance. Oh, tell me about... Speaking of plummy British history... Yeah, more biopics. <laughs> tell me about the man who invented Christmas. Well, I invented Christmas. Okay. So this is a film about me. <laughs> and what? how cool I am for inventing Christmas. No, this is a film about... What? About sexy young Charles Dickens, Ooh. played by sexy Dan Stevens, Ooh. with his sexy blonde mane and his sexy blue eyes. And he's had a couple of hits. Uh, Martin Chuzzlewit just came out, and Martin Chuzzlewit is kind of tanking. In fact, he had three bombs in a row. Even Oliver Twist wasn't it was, it was a hit, but people are waiting for him to recreate the success of Oliver Twist. Right. 
And uh, he he he's Spielberg around the time like 1941 came out. Thereabouts. Yeah, you're just sort of just like, <laughs> is he gonna? Is that all we get out of him? What's gonna happen here? What, what Francis year? Ford Coppola hasn't directed a good movie in 20 years. What's going on? What 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 year was 1941? <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird question. <laughs> uh, I want to say 79. 79. So it was around there. It was, was pre Raiders. Yeah. So this is the story of the making of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. But instead of Raiders of the Lost Ark, it is a Christmas Carol. Yeah. Which wasn't a novel. It was like a novelette. It was a little tiny thing. Yeah. But it's still considered one of Dickens' great works. Well, it's certainly one of his most influential and well-known. That's true. Like, everyone gets... Mm-hmm. That's another one where everyone knows the and, gist of it. And in, in the post-film sort of Chiron that appears on the screen, they just said, And Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol, and it affected the way we all celebrate Christmas. The end. It's like... That's it? You know, you're not going to give us a little bit more <laughs> historical context? Nope, no, that's no. it. You know the gist of it. You yeah, saw the Disney version. You but, saw the other Disney version. And th- this is artificial to within an inch of its life. It is production <laughs> designed and wonderful set and great photography and everything is shiny and clean. It's a Dickens story. Well, that's Where's Dickens. The- Dickens was filth. Where's the filth? <laughs> He dealt with filthy orphans and impoverished people. There's this is a Dickens story with no dirt on it, which is really ironic. <laughs> but yeah, it tells the story of how Dickens, you know, who couldn't couldn't stop having kids and was constantly in deep deep debt and needed a hit. And mm. w- it was about the process and of essentially getting money to his leechy father, whom he loved but was a leech and spent time in debtor's prison, played by Jonathan Price, mm-hmm. uh, and getting money for this book that he wanted to look a certain way and he wanted to hire certain artists to do the the uh, inscriptions and get these like special binding. Like He needed a lot of money to write and make this movie, but all he was lacking was inspiration. Write this book, you mean. Not for, make this movie. Or excuse me, write this book. Yeah, that's that's the framework by which we're going to be viewing it, but he, he was writing a book. He was writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> to write the book. It was, took a surprising amount of money to write the book. To, write, to get the book put together I, as an object. I would like to know, because like I love this sort of genre of not just a biographical film but a biographical film about someone who made something with which we are all intimately familiar yeah. like something well, like Shakespeare in Love for example which is all about the making uh, of Romeo and Juliet here's... but it's full of all of these cute little things mm. that imply that uh, uh, you know Shakespeare every idea in Romeo and Juliet or every idea throughout Shakespeare it's something he ran into some, on the street some specific yeah, yeah. reference there's a, there's a great slash terrible uh, <laughs> Lifetime original movie <laughs> called Magic Beyond Words, the J.K. Rowling story, which well, is amazing. We, if you're a Harry God. Potter fan and you've never seen it, stop what you're doing right now and watch it. I think it's on <laughs> Netflix or Amazon Prime. Or, it's somewhere. Well, and that, it is... Magic it, Beyond Words. Yeah. So, like, it opens... Like, every... Just take a drink, if you're of drinking age. Take a drink every time... Uh, something foreshadows Harry Potter. Yeah, like there's well, this, she, like it opens uh, with her dressed as a witch, running through the woods, making up stuff about Harry Potter stuff as a little girl, and then it cuts to her like in high school, and she's like smoking behind the gymnasium mm-hmm. with a lanky red haired guy who says, "Let's skip class," and mm-hmm. she says, "You're such a weaselly guy." And his name is Ron. I don't think his name was Ron, but that's all you needed. Oh my and then God. there's like another bit where she's on a train and she's oh. staring out the window like Harry Potter one day would. And someone comes by with a, with a snack cart. And the, I think they muffled the, the sound of her offering snacks. But she says, beans. And then she goes, and says, did you just offer me every flavor of beans? No, I offered you jelly beans. What a silly idea. Ha 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 ha. Amazing! And, and is you it like that? Punch yourself in the face. Does he? Has, is he having trouble oh, with the ending of a Christmas Carol and a guy named Ghost Futurson like shows up? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's here's the gimmick. He is looking for inspiration. He talks to other people. He runs ideas by people, and then he goes into his writerly room and he tries to write, but he's always being interrupted. Yeah. But when he's in his writerly room, writing down a Christmas Carol, coming up with these characters, and he spitballs. Na- he has you know he's famous for his funny names mm-hmm. like was Whinge, Mister Debt, Mister mm-hmm. Scrooge, of Mad course. Stone. And he says, Mist- yeah, <laughs> he says Mister Scrooge, and who should appear in the room with him but Ebenezer Scrooge, played by Christopher Plummer, and Christopher Plummer. <sighs> Playing Scrooge begins having conversations with Dickens about how a lot of his Scroogeiness is derived from his hatred of his own father. So there's a little bit of Freud and slipped in there. Sure. Uh, 
But yes, there is nothing worse than watching a biopic about a musician and having them sort of spitball a really famous riff. Like when when June Carter's playing Ring of Fire on an auto harp at one point and right. Walk the Line or um even worse when Kim Fowley like just sort of makes up Cherry Bomb in front of everybody. It's like, okay, I got a song. It's called Cherry Bomb. It's going to be your big hit. Hold on, let me think of it. <laughs> it's like, what was it in uh, that Britney Spears movie Crossroads where she's I'm like, not a girl yet, not a woman. Yeah, so like she's she's a pre med car mechanic high school student who travels across the country to visit her birth mother. And at one point, she they pick up a hitchhiker of memory serves. Yeah, and she's got she's also a poet, and she's he's going to take her poetry, which is I'm not a girl, not yet a woman, and he's. Gonna to put it to music and there's this insufferable scene of him like tinkling at the piano and her like making up the melody of this oh, hit song we already knew at the God. time and it is just you're just watching it like oh fuck no shut up <laughs> shut up crossroads britney spears tan in that movie is something that is not human it is so strange it's a very odd film she, she looks like a something you, you take out of an oven it's just this weird color she is painted in i, that, I in blame i i blame uh, i blame the lighting it's bad lighting, bad Someone makeup, whatever it is. She, she has a very yeah. strange skin tone. In it's that it's not a good film. But uh, the man who the man who saved Christmas, <laughs> the dog who saved Christmas, <laughs> uh, is the dog who saved Christmas is a real movie. It is just as pl- just as plummy, just as approachable, just as affable, just as artificial as any Hallmark Channel original movie. Then yeah, I'm just, sold. It's just an A production because they have yeah. these really well known British actors, and it's actually like well directed and well edited. Well, like listen, it's a Christmas but, movie in mm. a lot of ways, and Christmas is a time for schmaltz. Like I'm I'm really mm. willing to forgive a lot of schmaltz in a Christmas a, movie. A Christmas Time. Yeah, yeah, Christmas is a really emotional, difficult time for this, a lot of people. I don't, I don't begrudge yeah. anyone who watches, myself included, who <laughs> watches the Hallmark Channel right now for well, their twenty-four hour silly Midwest ode to Christmas marathons. And, and someone who looks like Lacey Chabert just can't find a guy. <laughs> yeah, how many times are they going to remake Groundhog Day and or Family Man? Let's find out. <laughs> Woo! We, we got several years of human history left in us. <laughs> But yeah, if you like Schmaltz, this film applies it with a trowel. Okay. And, and it's fun to see Dan Stevens, who's a talented actor. He's so good. Just sort of goofing off, it seems like. It seems like he's just fooling around in this one. He's, he's one of those actors who is just so damned handsome. Like, he's mm. distractingly handsome. <laughs> that it, it's sometimes... Dan Stevens? Yeah, like, but sometimes he's just sort of like... Asked to be there and look good. Like, he plays the, uh, the prosecuting attorney in that uh, legal thriller, uh, Marshall. Okay. Um, which is based on the real case Thurgood Marshall uh, mm. tried before he became long before he became a Supreme Court justice, and it's just it, it's it's a great role for Chadwick Boseman. It's even a great role for for Josh Gad. It's a nothing role for Dan Stevens. Mm. He's just got to be there. He's got to look the part. He's got to be smug, and then he's got to leave. That's and it. That's all he's asked to do. He's good at that. <laughs> and listen, that's that's a role. That's the function that role served in the story. But when Dan Stevens has something meaty to work with, aka the guest, <laughs> which is one of the greatest films ever made. I love the guest. <laughs> the guest so is so goddamn good. much. The guest is so good. <laughs> yeah, he's great in it though. He's get to be funny and scary and intimidating and approachable. It's just he gets to be everything in that thing. Mm. So I love Dan Stevens as an actor, and I'm always excited to see him get to have some fun. And it sounds I like just, it sounds fun at I, least. I'm afraid that he might be going down the Gerard Butler route and might be just Ooh. doing action thrillers after a while. He was in a, a oh gosh, what was it called? I think it was Kill Switch or something, or some weird science fiction video game-ish thriller that he was in this year that nobody saw and nobody cares about, except for my wife, who's a big Dan Stevens fan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he he's, has had a very strange career, Dan Stevens, and it's interesting to see him play... Charles Dickens, and I would love to see more biographies of Charles Dickens. Not, you know, Lord knows there have already been plenty. Yeah, there was the one with uh, Ray Fiennes a couple of years ago with the, the Invisible Woman. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, what um, wasn't particularly good. I, I like, okay. you know what? I like the Dickens episode of Doctor Who. Did you that's ever a, see that, that one? <laughs> well, there's yeah. a couple of Dickens. There's one where they actually met Charles Dickens. That's the that's the one I meant. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one with Christopher Eccleston. I think it was Christopher Eccleston, right? Wasn't that one? It was Eccleston or Tennant. It was around there. It was, it was yeah. The early ones, and they, they they met him. There were ghosts, and he was inspired. Blah. Mm. And then there was, of course, uh, uh, the. Christmas Carol special with Matt Smith, which is actually one of my favorite okay. Doctor Who Christmas specials. I, I watch it every year and it makes me cry but, every time. Do, do they have like a sci-fi explanation for the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future? Oh, it's time travel. 
Oh, of course. He takes him to the past. He goes to the past. He goes, oh. it's all, every ghost is the doctor. Oh, that's funny. That's, a, it's, it's, is it, it, if is you it think a, about it, Christmas Carol is a time travel story. Uh, no, totally it is. It really, it's kind of fascinating, actually. And in fact, it, it was such a famous, uh, framework. Dickens actually wrote other stories with that exact same framework. Yeah, people works. like visiting different time frames and seeing their, like, their lives in microcosm. There was also a later episode of Doctor Who where all of, like, every timeline, like, every timeline, every every moment <laughs> in time existed Russell simultaneously. Doctor, no. Okay. But, like, you know, like, so, like, mm. you know, the Roman, the ancient Roman Empire is around and so is spaceships and mm. so is contemporary BBC America and there was this bit where there was a, in that timeline that got invented because of some cataclysm and the whatever, oh. uh, there was an, there was a TV interview with Charles Dickens asking what his next Christmas special is going to be about. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> it was actually like, that's, that's well done. cute. Well done. Well done. That's amusing. Um, yeah. But anyway, hit back to history. Christmas yeah. Carol was a big hit. Uh, Charles Dickens went on to make his more famous books. Uh, David Copperfield was still ahead of him. Yeah. And uh, Bleak House was still ahead of him. Great Expectations was near a, the end of his career. So I think he, David, uh, David uh, Charles Dickens is just such a fun, interesting, like, historical figure for me because I think people forget how much of a blockbuster storyteller he was. And you think about oh, Charles yeah. Dickens now yeah. when you're young and you're like, oh, it's one of those old books with all of those metaphors and themes. And I'm like, this? He was like the Roland Emmerich of his time. He, well, was, he was really not a, telling big not a, stories. Not only Roland were, Emmerich, but he popularized the novel form in a way that other authors weren't doing. Like, he and Jane Austen are essentially responsible for the English language novel as we know it, more yeah. or less. Not in, that they in terms being of, made, in terms of like totally different. pop entertainment. Also, he was very keen on acting, and he would read his stories aloud in front of large uh, audiences. That's how he made a lot of his money. Yeah. It was just reading his stories. People weren't going out and buying the books. Yeah, he was. He, he, here's what he was a Stephen King. He was the Stephen King of his time. That's probably the closest analog we have. Everyone he, knew the I, name. You've read. He, you've read Charles, his biggest book. Charles Dickens. I don't think I we need a metaphor. Well, no, but, yeah. I just feel like I feel like it's important to contextualize this because you hmm. can. It's easy to forget just kind of what kind of a storyteller Charles Dickens was hmm. when you only think of what he is now. Yeah, at the time true. he was very mainstream, and mm. so it's it's kind of it's kind of it's kinda oh. fun. So on a I've, scale of uh, a C minus to C plus, uh, I mean it's a C. It's like just a C. Just, just just plop in the you middle. Sounded a little C. passionate about it. C ness. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I there's a lot going on. There's a lot of fun things to describe, but it, it it's just treacle. There's not a lot of depth to this story whatsoever. Oh. It's completely predictable. It's, oh. it's also the past, so you know how it's how it's going to end up anyway. True. There's not a huge drama in this story. It's it, do, just, it doesn't blow your mind how Christmas Carol it, got it's, written. It's silly and it's cheap and it's corny, but, you know, it's not difficult to watch. Well, you mean the sentimentality is cheap. You said it's an A production. Like, they threw money. No, yeah, no, that's yeah. what I meant. It, I'm just making sure. The sentimentality right. is the cheap part. What, what about the Darkest Hour? The Darkest Hour? Um, a, a high C. Hmm. For very many of the same reasons. Even though it's a much more stern and uh, slicker production, Yeah, it still is dealing with things that we already kind of know. It's reinforcing rather than introducing. I, I'm going to give it a C plus with a caveat. I think it's mm. definitely worth seeing. Just mm. make sure you take it with a little bit of a grain of salt historically. As a movie, it is very, very satisfying and Gary Oldman is really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I forgot to really single out uh, Ben Mendelsohn plays uh, the king. Oh, yeah. Uh, the same character, uh, mm. the same historical figure Colin Firth played in The King's right. Speech. George the... Sixth, fifth, or sixth? Oh crap! Okay. I totally right. forgot. It's the fifth or the sixth. One of them. And uh, <laughs> I actually, I actually prefer Ben Mendelsohn. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah, character. He's well, really great. I, again, if you've seen the King's Speech, you yeah. understand why he talks the way he does. Yeah, so like, that that's kind of interesting. And, and you watch, watch the King's Speech too. Watch Start all it. watch all three of these in rapid succession. Yeah, King, Tri- triple. Start feature. with the King's Speech, then go to Darkest Hour, and then about halfway through Darkest Hour, start watching Dunkirk, and then finish Darkest Hour. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> it's it's a machete good. order, like yeah. you have for Star Wars. <laughs> and then a Coco. We uh, we a Coco C plus. Okay, it, it's just just good. Great, just good. Awesome, glad to hear it. Pixar doing good stuff again. All right, uh, we have the second half of our lightning round to do, but we'll do that after we tackle a very epic, very important... S- speaking of pairing up films, yeah. we have not one, not two, not three, but five films. Five fucking films. <laughs> the- All about a golden retriever named Buddy. Yeah. Now, I want to uh, clarify real fast, because uh, when we announced that we were doing all five of the Air Bud movies, there were mm-hmm. a couple people who waved their fingers, raised their hand. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Okay. Because there's like 14 okay. of those things. Calm down, nerds. Okay, we're all <laughs> nerds about this. And I, I was tempted to do it, but I think what we, the conclusion we came to, and I think we mentioned this before uh-huh. on a previous episode, but the conclusion we came to is that after the first five Air Bud movies, mm-hmm. which are very much of a piece, and we'll yes. talk about that, 
the franchise changes completely. It is tangentially related, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of things that, for example, all the sports are gone, becomes an entirely different series of, of storylines, and also we start getting magic. Yeah. It's yeah. a completely different thing that just sort of turned. It's sort of like, uh, 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 I, I don't say I don't even know if I, I can think of a good uh, example. Suffice it to say, the first five are one franchise, and then the next nine are about talking dogs, which is a very different thing. It's not about Bud at all, it's about new characters. Yep. No, the, the, not even about Buddy's children. Like, we had his children show up for the first mm-hmm. time in the first five movies. Like, it's going to be very. It's going to be an interesting sit. And uh, it, additionally to the Air Buddies films, there is another spinoff mm. of Santa Buddies mm-hmm. called Santa Paws. Ah? And there is also a sequel to Santa Paws. So this is like a family. Tr- it's just an endlessly cascading spinoff franchise. Now, I'm sure everybody will get their own movie at some point. Air Bud started off as kind of a joke. Like, it was. Just, it's a stupid idea if you think about it. Let me just finish. Mm. Because it's a story, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, about a kid who befriends a dog, and the dog can play basketball. The end. Well, Sergio, it, get off the counter. The dog can't play... You can't play basketball, basketball. Sergio. Get off the counter. The, the boy finds that if he bounces a ball in front of his dog, the dog can bounce the ball off of his snout and make a basket. Yeah. So it doesn't really... Like, it doesn't dribble or pass or, you know make th- free throws well, it just <laughs> the first air bud is actually relatively grounded but even so it was just, it's a silly idea for a movie mm. it's obviously a very broad family type uh, uh motion picture and then it just spawns sequel after sequel after sequel and when i was in college it was a, a joke it was it was it was a, it was, it was, it was a punchline oh my god i can't believe they're still making these stupid movies it, and i had a teacher definitely who, a punchline movie and in fact it yeah. contains one of the most notorious lines of dialogue in all of cinema history i think ain't no rule that says a dog can't play basketball yeah i love that line i love, I love it too but it's, it's a great <laughs> line well, i really want to talk about how the movie kind of reverse engineers its concept because it's mm. really fascinating but i just want to say um, I know a lot of people really look down on it, and I used to as well, mm-hmm. until a, a, a teacher, a screen reading teacher, took me aside, well, not me, he mentioned it in class, because mm-hmm. everyone was making fun of it, and he said, L- listen, I know it's a stupid idea. You know it's a stupid idea. The people who like them know it's a stupid idea. But some writer out there had the idea for a dog who played basketball, wrote it well enough... And now he never has to work again. <laughs> and we all kind of went, oh, yeah, all right, huh. shut our mouths. <laughs> shut our mouths. That made a lot of people happy. It's like it's t- a franchise yeah. made a lot of people happy. You can't really like, this isn't like one of those things where it's just like it tanked and everyone hated it. It's like, this was very popular. It spawned, it's, it's still going in some respects. Well, it, it spawned its own uh, ch- like animal shelter charity. Yeah. It's like a buddies society now that helps dogs in need. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea of an animal playing sports is not unique to Airbud. There's a lot of precedent for it. There's Gus. Uh, which one's Gus? The the field goal kicking mule. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I was thinking of uh, oh what's that one with uh, Matilda with Elliot Gould where he plays a boxing promoter whose boxer is a kangaroo. <laughs> it's a guy in a kangaroo suit. Nobody talks about that movie. It was made back when Elliot Gould was like one of the most bankable stars in America, uh, and it's just like hey, 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 we're never talking about that again. <laughs> Remember when Elliot Gould was the sexiest man alive? That was a weird that was a time. Weird time. Bless them. Um. So. Airbud came out in 1997. It was directed by Charles Martin Smith, who you know Charles Martin Smith. You might know Charles Martin Smith. He's he's directed a lot, but he's also acted a lot. He mm. was the guy in uh, Brian De Palma's Untouchables, uh, who was the accountant who figured yeah, out yeah. how to get Al Capone. Like he had a really a uh, very lucrative, long, uh, think, successful career. But was he the one who's like, hey, what are you? I'm I'm just an accountant for the police. Give him a gun. You're a real cop now. I was like, wait, wait a minute. I don't I don't touch guns. I'm an accountant. And then he grabs the gun, looks at it, and goes. <laughs> Uh, he was he was the uh, main human. Uh, the main in, human. The main human in Starman. Oh uh, yeah, he was in yeah. American Graffiti. Is it, yeah, uh, you may as well. He was in a movie that a Disney movie that doesn't get a lot of play, but everyone I know who's seen it loves it. Never Cry Wolf. Never Cry Wolf is pretty terrific. Yeah, it, it so, came out in like eighty three, I think. Yeah, so he's had a very long sex, a success, successful career, a sexy career. Yeah, well, I guess maybe I don't know. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and he directed this family film for Disney. It was released in theaters, and the story is very, very simple. It's about a young boy uh, who, uh, named, played by Kevin Zegers, mm-hmm. uh, whose father died of car crash cancerous. 
he, they never really talk about he, it. He died. He died of off-screen disease. Yeah, it, this happens a lot. There's a lot of Disney movies about kids without a dad. Very rarely mm-hmm. without a mom. Usually without a dad. And it's always something happened that was tragic. But I'm. It was just long enough ago that I'm starting to get over it. Yeah. This is the story but, about getting over it like a year later. So yeah, his 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 dad is dead. He's living with his mom and his infant sister. Yep. In in a small town in Washington. They moved to Washington. It's called Fernfield, and mm-hmm. it's a place where anything can happen. That's like on <laughs> that's on that every Airbud movie opens with mm-hmm. Fernfield, a place where mm-hmm. anything can happen. As if that's an excuse. Uh, as if you I put also, that in front of it, you just anything can happen in the movie and you're set. I also want to give a big shout out right away to Mike Southen, who is the film's photographer. That's a good looking movie. Because he shot Little Man Tate mm. and he shot the Ken Russell film Gothic. <laughs> oh my god! I love that movie. Speaking of great weird movies about authors and how they wrote things, yeah, yeah. Gothic is an amazing yeah. movie about the night that everyone did a lot of drugs and wrote the most influential horror novels of all time, including Frankenstein. Mm, it's, it's probably not how it happened, but it's pretty weird. It's, it's, it's Shelley, it's Byron, and it's Mary, and they're like taking drugs and. Like wandering around this bizarre interdimensional mansion where there's like a, automaton creatures walking around and it's super weird. having orgies and nightmare mo- yeah it's so, super such a great. strange film. Meanwhile, Airbud. Uh, so the kid, which is similar. Now that's so it's the story of this kid. It's also the story of a dog named Buddy. And the beginning of a movie, Buddy is a performing dog mm. working for an abusive birthday clown played by uh, Michael Jeter, Michael Jeter, the great late mm. Michael Jeter, who is one of those character actors who is awesome. Every time you saw him in a movie, you were just like, mm. "Oh, Michael Jeter's here. This scene's going to be great." Yeah. And but he's also one of those characters actor who is so specific that when he sadly passed away. We never found we a replacement. We couldn't for him. find that type again. That there are, there is no Michael Jeter character it's, it's, in movies he's like, JT, like they're used to. Be. JT Walsh or John Polito, like yeah. they, they just define themselves. Yeah, you if you put characters in a movie hoping to get this character actor to play him. So Michael Jeter plays this like rundown. You know, you gotta wonder why he does it because he clearly hates kids. And he hates, he hates the, the dog. He hates the dog a lot. Yeah. So the dog has been trained to. Balls. Yeah, just bounce, p- bounce balls off its nose. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's the gag. And he, and he does it at kids' birthday parties. Yeah, and he ruins the kids' birthday party, which the clown was already doing a great job of all by mm-hmm. himself. And the clown gets rid of the dog. The dog runs away. And he's still wearing this, like, clown getup, which mm-hmm. makes him seem like this tragic Batman yeah. character or something. <laughs> like, he's going to be turned into a toxic Avenger, but I was, a dog. I, I, was, I was performing in the opera, and they turned me into a dog. Please help me. <laughs> And eventually, the dog and the, the young boy find each other, and they're both suffering. The, the kid is going through mourning, and the dog has is learning to trust humans again. In fact, they even do like that bit in ET where he like gets the dog out from the cornfield uh, or whatever, <laughs> and like you know gets him to like it's, ease into know, it, like the fox and little prince. Buddy is a golden retriever, and golden retrievers always look happy. They're so just it's the happiest they're, looking dogs. They're, they're they're the friendliest breed, from what I understand. They're one of the least intelligent of the dog breeds but they're also also one of the friendliest which is why they make such popular pets and they're really loyal and they're great dogs so it's difficult for me to look at a golden retriever and think that poor thing is suffering (laughs) because it looks like it's smiling it always looks happy but here's the thing the lot of the movie is not the dog playing basketball the lot of it is this kid Learning to connect with someone again, mm-hmm. uh, you know, finding a, a place to 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 put all of his his love in a, in a, in a pet, mm-hmm. um, and then trying out for the basketball team, and then quite by accident, the dog like gets onto the field. The dog uh, hits a, a ball into the basket, which everyone's mm-hmm. kind of impressed by. Like, holy shit, what the? Did we just see that? <laughs> holy god! And at first, he doesn't play on the team. He actually is their half. Time show, mm. and they use that sort of you know raise money, blah 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 blah. And then it's watch only, the basketball dog. That's it's great. kind of yeah. only towards the end that he's brought in as like this hail mary thing, mm. and they have to do this whole bit. Now, what I kind of like about this movie is how whoever like I, the story is credited to uh, Kevin DeChico. The screenplay is credited to Paul Tomasi and Aaron Mendelson. So I, it's hard to say exactly who came up with which part, mm. but whoever came up with okay we got a basketball playing dog that's obviously the premise let's work backwards Mm. (laughs) and that's and that's how the story works Mm. it works very very efficiently i would teach this screenplay in a a class about how to take 
a kind of a silly idea and find a way to make it work. Mm. Dog plays basketball. Why would a dog know how to do that? He was a trained show dog. Okay, great. That makes sense. He's learned some tricks. The dog can't be the main character. You need a human. Who's who's he talking to? Well, how about a young kid who's like an avatar for the audience? Yeah, the dog's not going to suddenly join the NBA, but if it's okay if he's in high school, like or like mm. in junior high or something, that then you can imagine that being a bit more plausible and a mm. bit more accepted. Okay, great. Uh, so. How does the dog find his way into the, the kid's arms? Well, he was a show dog, but the show dog wasn't appreciated. Blah. It all kind of comes together. <laughs> Air Bud... In, in, that, a, in that Hollywood yeah. screenwriting textbook sort of way. I'm, yeah. I'm willing to accept, because this the franchise flies off the rails immediately after this. <laughs> well, that's when we start getting Russian spies, but it we'll gets, talk about that. It gets that. completely insane by the second movie. The first one is pretty good, actually. Like for, for a, If you're going to make a basketball dog mm. movie... This is the movie. And you you can tell the director is like punching a little below his weight. First of all, he got like such a great photographer. So it mm-hmm. looks like a real movie. There's a scene yeah. where he's like wandering uh Kevin Zegers is wandering like out through this field and the sun is going down. It's the magic hour and the pa- yeah. camera pans up. It's like something out of a Malick film all there's, of a there's sudden. There's some it's really good beautiful. shots in this movie. Uh also, uh, I wrote this down. Did you note the names on the backs of the kids' jerseys? Yes, during the basketball match. It's super weird. There's okay. a character. There's the okay. You have their last names. There's a Hawks. There's a Ford. There's a Houston, and there's a Fuller. Uh, I think there's actually isn't there like a Lubitsch as well? Is there a Lubitsch? I want to say that. Uh, did I, yes, there's a Lubitsch, and there's also a Lubitsch. So all of the kids, all of the kids except so, for the main kid, are named after famous classic film Howard directors. Howard Hawks, John Ford, John Houston, Samuel Fuller, and Ernst Lubitsch are all like really famous filmmakers from like the 30s to the 50s. People put some thought into this movie. Is our <laughs> point? Um, there's also like It'd be great if there was like a Kurosawa or <laughs> just like one that you cannot fudge, a Hitchcock. Yeah, like there's there's uh, there's also like a really sweet performance here mm. uh, from Bill Cobbs uh, as a former basketball player who's now just working at the school and becomes their coach mm. after it turns out that the first coach was actually being abusive to the kids. Mm. Like, just mistreating them, throwing basketballs at their head. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad that the movie just doesn't, like, let that... The movie, as soon as someone finds out about that, that's mm. gone. You don't have to deal with it. And then he, the Bill Cobbs takes over, and Bill Cobbs gives a very nice performance as a very good coach who cares more about teaching the kids to be a team mm. than winning. Yeah. And right. I think that's also a good thing that supports the whole dog thing. <laughs> because, like, listen, we're, it's not about winning. We don't care about championships right now. We're just trying to set a good example and be a positive environment for these kids. That's cool. Mm. That's all works great. And then um, and he also gives some really practical basketball advice. He does. Um, and I, I think they actually do this at schools where you play basketball with no ball. You, yeah, you pantomime you, the ball. You, pa- you pantomime the ball, so you have to kind of make eye contact, make sure you know who has it at any given moment. And if you can play just as quickly, you're playing better as a team, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, pl- the plot continues apace. Michael Jeter finds out that the, his dog is now famous, mm-hmm. and he comes to get the dog. And they pretty much just immediately give the dog to this weird stranger. Uh-huh. And it's the sort of thing you really, like, it, You, I would not trust. Because A, the dog clearly doesn't like him. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, okay, well, something's up there. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden the dog is famous and someone wants the dog and we're just going to give him the dog. And then there's a courtroom scene. Yeah, and then the kid breaks the dog out. And the kid's actually in the wrong because he didn't see him do anything illegal. So he mm-hmm. just stole the guy's property and the guy's car falls into a lake and they're in trouble. And there's this... But we hate him because he's an evil clown. Well, yeah. And well, we know he's a jerk. The kid doesn't. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. And as a result, the kid is technically ethically <laughs> in the wrong. And there's a big court case and the, the judge says, okay, stop, we'll let the stop. dog choose. Stop, stop. There's a big court case. Shut up. Is Shut it? up. You don't get their Capra moment, Air Bud. Oh, we, we should probably explain what Air Bud means. The, the name. It, well, do, it, do people it, still wear Air Jordans? Is that still a I thing? Know, but there was a thing. Air, was a thing Michael yeah. Jordan had a shoe line. They were Air Jordans. They were the mo- I had them. They were the most popular They're, sneakers. The, the for hot kids. shoe, and they named they named the movie after the shoe. Yeah. Now, Fine. I, I don't. Yeah. Sense. Again, if if you don't know what Air Jordans are, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> if that's still a thing. Uh, email us if you have a pair of Air Jordans. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> do you have the pump by Reebok? <laughs> do they still work? Uh, <laughs> is it filled with cheese. <laughs> um, it was, I was like, okay, so Air Bud mm. was followed closely yes. by Air Bud 2 
Golden first, Retriever. Gold, golden Receiver. Oh, sorry. Gold, Air, I always want to say it's Golden just Retriever. Air Bud, colon, Golden Receiver. And this came out the next, the year. next year. They rushed this into production. They, I assure and you, it they, looks like it. It is so, like, the third movie in the series looks less cheap than this one. Mm. Like, this is just cobbled together from, like, spare bits and parts. Mm. Now, the plot of this one is. Starts okay. Half of the plot is fine. Well, for, also, the mom is now a new actress. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I think the mom is a different actress in every film. Uh, no, 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 no. I wrote, we wrote some recently. It only feels that way. Got it right. goes uh, so. There's mom A, mm-hmm. and there's mom B, and there's mom C, and then there's mom B and mom B. So she comes back okay. after taking a break in the third film. Mm. Uh, and this is it's, she's played by what's her name from Happiness, Cynthia something. Oh, uh, uh, Cynthia uh, Stevenson. Cynthia Stevenson. Yeah, who's from, great. From I actually really yeah. like her a lot. She was on a sitcom I liked in the 90s called Hope and Gloria. Yeah. Uh, so the plot of this one is actually two plots kind of mm. shoved together awkwardly. The first one is uh, the kid is now um, trying out for the football team. He's lost interest in basketball, as kids do. Well, he just he also your, your wants to play int- football. Your interests I, change. He's or, actually it, not initially like all that gung ho about it. But he's got a friend who wants mm. to join up, and his mom is dating a guy uh, who but like, from Trapper John MD. <laughs> yeah, his mom is dating a guy who's into football, and he ends up playing some football, mm. and the football team stinks. Uh, and sure enough, Buddy turns out is actually pretty good at football too. Who knew? And there's this <laughs> weird bit where they put Buddy in like a helmet and a jersey, but they give him shoulder pads, so they that jut out on the sides, which would make it just more awkward for a dog to run. It looks but, ridiculous. Yeah. Like you're just they're trying way too hard. They're trying way too hard to make it work. There's actually a line of this one which is almost as crazy. Almost as just ludicrous. That there's no golden retriever. That, that one. there's a golden receiver. <laughs> yeah. And we have a title of a stupid sequel. Okay, now, no, the plot of this one is just really simple. He plays football, buddy's good at football, mom dates a new guy, mm. kid comes to accept the new guy. Mm. That's it. Problem is, that's like a 45 minute movie. And you can tell because it looks like it. The rest of the movie was shot with like B-roll and a different crew, and I think there's only one scene of the two stories intersecting. And even that's barely. And it, it's like on a pier. It's like, like they snuck out onto a pier and shot it, you know, Sub Rosa. It seriously looks like they shot a whole movie that was just Air Bud again, realized mm. it was too short or thought it was too boring, and they threw in a couple of Russian Boris and Natasha knockoffs mm. who are stealing uh, uh, talented animals to start their own circus. And so there'll be these really tender scenes of the kid bonding with the dog, worrying about his mother moving on, and they'll just intercut with, and it looks like it's on a different location on a different day. Different lighting, even. Yeah. yeah. Like Nora Dunn and <laughs> uh, this guy, uh, Perry Ancelotti, mm. just like, the dog is over there! Get him! Mm. Hitting him with his hat. And you're just sort of like, what are we, what are you doing? And who is doing construction outside our window while we're podcasting? Uh, on, on Thanksgiving weekend. Go home. Go What's home. What's up going with your family? Which we're not doing. <laughs> no, well, fair enough. Um, but yeah, oh God, just watching these Boris and Natasha wannabes is just so painful. This was theatrical. It's not funny like, yeah. at all. It's not even decent comic relief. It's just painful. And, and, and you know, I... I admit, when I was a kid, I had terrible taste, just like most little kids. Sure. And I uh, found certain things funny that aren't funny anymore. And I was trying to cast my mind back, watching these like Boris and Natasha characters, to a time when I was younger, to a time when I might have found them funny, and I wasn't finding it. Like, I wasn't finding the, the, the youthful exuberance in myself that could have looked at those characters and thought, that's hilarious. Right. And I liked Hot to Trot. You know, this is... <laughs> Uh, it, it, there's just nothing good about this extra little layer. It, it's like such an unnecessary story, and I guess it's the only sort of thing that they could have written into the basketball or the football playing dog without actually changing yeah. anything. Because like, yeah, like the dog is just like he's he's kidnapped, he escapes, and the kid doesn't help. I don't even think the kid finds out about it. No, like the, dog does, the dog does it himself with the help of like monkeys and stuff. It's, it's all like completely useless. And then you start thinking about it because after with the because the first film worked so hard to try to make the basketball element at least kind of organic. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The artificiality and just the problems with letting a dog mm. play football start getting really really difficult. So like, okay, see basketball isn't a full contact sport the way football is. Mm. Football, you're running into people. Who's 
who's so gonna soon? tackle who would, that dog? Who would, who would tackle? Oh, I would love to see a B plot about a rival on the other team who knows he's gonna go up against the dog, and he's been assigned to cover the dog. Yeah, and he has to psych himself up to tackle a dog, and he doesn't want to because it's a cute golden retriever, and you don't want to tackle. You a can dog hurt, and hurt that it. dog. The, yeah. And the dog is extremely low. Like there's mm-hmm. there's there's actually a lot of advantages <laughs> to having that dog. Like it's actually not fair mm-hmm. to the other teams. There's actually like a, it's like a, letting kittens in the puppy bowl. It's just not right. <laughs> is this the one? Because there's one of them, and uh, where like the coaches are actually like trying to get the dog like disqualified. I mm-hmm. know. Oh, I think it's the next one. I think it's the next one oh, where like I think it's seventh inning fetch. Yeah, and... seventh inning fetch, and some guy, the, the other team is just like, don't that's Air Bud. We're gonna lose. Yeah, <laughs> like it's we we've heard the legends. It's like the it's like the the game description in Wet Hot American Summer. It's like, well, we're gonna pull together and beat this ambiguously evil team, and they just you know that all sounds really cliched. Yeah, I talked to the other team; they they think it's cliched too. We're just not gonna play. Yeah, you go. <laughs> we're just gonna go home. So in the third film, Wait, but you forgot the celebrity cameos. Oh, apologies. The, the announcers at the football game. Oh right, go ahead. <laughs> are played by Dick Martin and uh, Tim Conway. Yeah, we're very famous comedians. Uh-huh. There's this weird tradition that they have in the Airbud movies where there have to be color commentators on all of the sports, even when it is ludicrous. Uh-huh. Why do we have someone doing a radio show about a junior high school yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like baseball match? There's literally no reason. Mm-hmm. And the acting in those scenes gets bigger and crazier and dumber every mm-hmm. time just to sort of dangle your keys in mm-hmm. front of the kids in the audience. Just yeah. the, You like that? You like when he jumps up and down? No, we, we really don't. We're just here for the dog. <laughs> oh my god, that is so annoying! I am yeah. so sorry if that's picking up yeah, on the microphone. You want to pause it and close the door? Yeah, well, I'll just I'll just close the door. Right. Tell us about Airbud Three World Pup. Uh, Airbud Three World Pup. All right. Um, uh, this was the first uh, straight to video of the uh, Airbud movies. Um, we still have uh, Kevin Zegers still playing Josh. He's now into soccer. Um, well, he's into soccer because, because there's a new girl there's at school. There's a girl at school yeah. who is also into soccer, and I think the girl is played by like a, a real soccer player. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think she was an actress. I don't know. Um, I did not look that up. The mom's a new actress. Mm-hmm. The The new love interest is played by Dale Midkiff. Oh, no, it's the same love interest. He's just a different actor well, the, now. Same character, but it's not yeah. played by the, Dale Midkiff. It is always a new dad. Yeah. It, is, it is only sometimes a new mom. Mm-hmm. So this is Dale Midkiff from the TV miniseries of The Stand. Uh, um and and uh, he's definitely a time lord. That's my only <laughs> that's my my only uh, explanation as to how these people keep changing. Yeah. So uh, so it opens with uh, his mom getting remarried, uh, and uh, not only does this new girl in town uh, capture the eye of young Josh, but she, she also a, has a, a she's British. She's very exotic. Very she's an British. exchange student, and she also has mm-hmm. a golden retriever of her own. That's right. And Buddy falls in love with this golden retriever. And there are these weird bits where it starts getting pretty implausible, mm-hmm. where the dog is, like, getting her gifts, and you're not really buying it. And it's super weird. Yeah. Here's something weird. I've, I've seen a couple dog films for kids. First of all, it, it's a blight on cinema, but... <laughs> There's a there's, couple there's, of good there's ones. A, uh, well, there's, there's a couple of good ones. We just said Air Bud's okay. Air Bud's okay. For every Air Bud, there's a hundred that aren't. Yeah. And uh, there tends to be, strangely, a romantic subplot with the animals. Like, where there's a, a dog with a bow in its hair, and the male dog chases the dog with a bow in its hair. And People like it d- when d- people little, end up together. I, I, I understand that's an ancient, you know comedy trope going back as far as, you know, Commedia dell'arte, where the, the comedies end with marriages. But, re- I mean, do little kids really want to see dogs romance each other? I, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't particularly care. I guess they just ran out of stuff to do yeah. after a while. Well, I wrote down the names of the dogs that played Buddy in this film. Oh, good. Yeah, Dakota Walker... Shooter, Tango, and Poacher. There you go. Are the dogs that played Buddy? Uh, t- but Buddy sadly passed away after the production of the first Air Bud. Yeah, they that- wanted to get the same dog back, but the dog died. So yeah, it is, it they, is- they, they got a bunch of golden retrievers in every sequel. Well, yeah, to do different bits. In fact, they even recycle some shots of the original dog. I think in the second one, because mm-hmm. uh, there's this gag he does where he like climbs out of like a upstairs window and like down onto a car and everything like that. And mm-hmm. it's an imp- it's all in one shot. It's an impressive mm-hmm. dog. And stunt. to the the series credit, they go. Go back to the same house for every film. Yeah, they shoot in the same house. There's a lot so, of continuity, yeah. and I appreciate that. Mm. Um, 
Even though the people change, but the house remains. The subplot on this one is dog nappers. Of course, because of course there is. Just a bunch of dog nappers, mm-hmm. and Buddy gets kidnapped, and they have to rescue Buddy and get back in time for the big game. Why do they want to kidnap Buddy? Because he has the sport gene. No, 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 no. That's the fourth one. Is it? Yeah, you got that one wrong. No, the, in this no, one, no, they no, start no, no. talking about the but, like Buddy's superior sports DNA. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm pretty no. sure. No, no, because that's because right. they, they don't just need Buddy's DNA. They need the Buddy of all of his, uh, the DNA of all of his offspring as well. And they want to clone him. Yeah, but that's the fourth one. I promise you, I just watched it. All right, fine. You watched these a little while ago. Little while I watched ago, them this yeah. week. Yeah, no, 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 no. Trust me. The fourth one is where it all comes together, and I'm really excited mm. to talk about that because it gets weird. Mm. Err. Um, <laughs> but this one, actually, this one, again, it's basically just recycling the plot of the second one but now it's actually like a bit tied in together a little better like they they don't the, feel like they were shot on a different set the, the romances all are th- at least thematically linked yeah there's a reason for here's, it like they give the dog a subplot just like they give the kid a here, subplot here's something I appreciate you'll notice in all of these movies that Buddy is never the one to score the winning goal it's always Josh Josh always mm. makes the winning well, goal. Well, or, or some but, kid, but yeah. Or some other kid. It, Buddy is the assist. Yeah, but like, he's there to help. His presence help, you know, helps them win and forces them to win, makes them win, but yeah. uh, he's not like the single star. And he's only there for emotional support. Yeah. Given that this is a child without a father figure, is Buddy, his father, reincarnated? Yes. I assume I've, yes. I've, I've unlocked. Yeah, that's, that makes more that's sense kind, to kind me. Of, yeah, kind of what they were getting at. I think, I, I think that's what they're doing. Yeah. Well, they, they again. We start getting down a different continuity rabbit hole mm-hmm. in the next one. This one ends now. In the last one, it actually began with uh, Josh and his family, and they go to an NBA game, mm-hmm. and Buddy ends up on the court and does something cool, and everyone's like, "Ooh, mm-hmm. okay." This one ends with Air Bud having learned soccer, mm-hmm. having become really good at soccer. At the Women's World Cup, and the female goalie, it goes down to, like, you know, kicking, you know, right at the end, you Mm -hmm. know, whoever loses, whatever. Uh, The goalie sprains her ankle or something, and they have to send in Buddy. Uh, At at the World Cup. At the World Cup. And here's the thing. There ain't no rule that says a dog can't play in the World Cup. (laughs) But I'm willing to bet there is a rule that says a man can't play in the Women's World Cup. Buddy is still a male male. dog. Yeah. Yeah. That is Fucked up, and I am not okay with that. That's just cheating. At that it's, point, that's yeah. just cheating. It, it's it's going one too far. That's way too far. You've broken Airbud. Didn't didn't and didn't the the girl had a girl dog? Let the girl dog play. Why not? <laughs> Airbud four seventh inning fetch. I'm surprised that they had to get through football and soccer before getting to baseball. Well, at, at some point, I think they were trying to be a little bit more plausible because in seventh inning fetch, Buddy actually does bat. <laughs> he actually okay, he does hold, have a baseball in his teeth. He holds a, a baseball bat in his teeth, and he just... Now, they can't really get the dog to, like, sort of whip its head around to make no. it look... Like, it, did, it can only get the dog to essentially, like, look off camera, like, yeah. turn its head slightly. So they use not-so-clever editing to make it look like they, they do these, like, 100-mile-an-hour pitches, and the dog can hit it with a bat. And the thing is, it's not softball. It's baseball. The dog mm. catches that baseball in its teeth. His teeth are gonna break. <laughs> like, it's actually, like, really dangerous. Well, Buddy's uh, bu- Buddy has enhanced DNA. He's like Cujo. That's right. We do find out. This is the one where we find out he has the super. Cujo, what was the one with the man's best friend? There you the, go. The big evil. I love how insane man's best friend is. It is not readily available <laughs> enough. If you ever wanted to see Ali Sheedy adopt a scientifically engineered dog that can turn invisible and eat cat's hole mm. and cut mm. her boyfriend's brake line, <laughs> man's best friend is the film. It is really entertaining and terrible, but it is really oh, entertaining. 1990 was a wonderful time. So in Air Bud 4, 7th mm. inning fetch, we are introduced to, mm. sort of, a mad scientist who wants to take from Buddy the super sports gene. Mm. But in order to do it, he also needs the DNA of Buddy's puppies, which he had with the dog from the last movie. And those puppies have all been given to various people throughout the, uh, throughout the neighborhood. Now, these are not the Air Buddies, because when we mm. meet them here, they're fully grown. One of them's playing basketball. One of them's working at uh, uh, the gas station. Yeah, yeah. It's a bunch of different dogs. But what's interesting, and I think it's this one that kind of unlocks the whole series, the actor who plays the mad scientist who just wants Buddy's super sports gene and put in a centrifuge and sell it to the black market, I don't know what he's going to do. He's played by... Put it in kombucha. He's played by an actor named Jay Brazo. I hope okay. I'm pronouncing that right. 
Jay Brazo is also the name of the uh, is also the actor mm-hmm. who played the guy who in the first movie says. Ain't no rule says a dog can't play basketball. <laughs> He's also the guy in the second that. film mm-hmm. who, who says, Ain't no rule says a dog can't play football. Which means... He's gone This mad. was all... No, this was all his plan all along. <laughs> He's like Mr. Glass and Unbreakable. He's yeah. testing the dogs of the world. It's, it's like, he's, like, uh, he's like the Watchers in Fringe. He just watches. He's always there. This is all part of his scheme. His machinations. Because those characters in the other movies, they don't have names. They're just referee or official. Here, he finally has a name. He is the bad guy. He has a pet raccoon who helps him kidnap Buddy. Meanwhile... Uh, Josh has gone off to college, and uh, his younger sister has taken up the uh, protagonist role yeah. in the series. And she uh, and, and uh, Andrea is the character's name. Yeah, Andrea and her best friend. Uh, or no, Tammy is the girl. Andrea is the best friend. No, Tammy's the best friend. Tammy's the best. Friend. She's the one who's actually good at baseball. Okay, yeah, yeah. So these two characters, who I think we met in the previous one, uh, mm. Tammy's consistent throughout the series, actually, and there's some good content. And Tammy's there. great, by the way. Yeah, she's a really she's, charming she's a actor, sp- spunky little actress. Yeah. So uh, they do baseball. Mm-hmm. Turns out uh, Air, Bud's, uh, Air Bud's owner isn't very good at baseball. Bud joins the baseball. Bada bing! He's, he's, a, <laughs> he's a dog. He wants to do what his owners are doing. Turns out he's just good at whatever his owners are doing. Pretty much. As long as to, it's sports related. I, I was about to say, I hope they take up surgery next. This movie is... <laughs> no, Marmaduke. Don't use the triple overhand stitch. Bad, bad dog! dog. <laughs> this movie is 71 minutes long, and it is full of padding. Yeah. There's so many montages and riding through town scenes. It's kind of... Mm. It's not very good. <laughs> the movie... The third one... Okay, here's, here's how it works. The first Air Bud's a pretty good movie. Mm. For what it is. Second one's terrible. Third one, it's watchable. It's like, a, it's like a dumb kids movie. Like, it's okay. So it's fine. I've seen worse. And the rest of them are pretty terrible. <laughs> like this one's not a good movie. This Buddy, Buddy is now played by Shaq, Dakota, Shooter, Sniper, and Tango. Great. Which I think were the characters from Predator. <laughs> 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 Actually, I think I think those are a lot of the names of uh, Buddy's uh, puppies as well. I know Shooter is one, yeah. and I want to say Tango is another one. Um, there's a weird thing because again, Buddy goes to bat mm. in this one, and that's another instance in which having a dog on the team puts the other team at a massive disservice because his strike zone has got to be microscopic. He's he's a, and it's really low, so yeah. the pitcher has to now change up their entire game to you know throw low into that strike. Zone. And it is absurd to me that we have a movie about a dog playing baseball. It's a movie about a dog, mm. and at no point does the opposite team decide to walk the dog. Mm. To walk the dog. I I heard you. I, to walk the dog. I, I got I wanna it. Make sure everyone at home gets that. I got it. I didn't want it. To walk the dog. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, uh, pa- Patrick Cranshaw's in this one too. I don't know who Patrick Cranshaw. Is. You know who Patrick Cranshaw. Which is. one's Patrick? He, he was the old man in the back of the truck in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh, he, he plays was, the sheriff. He's the sheriff. Oh yeah, he yeah. plays the sheriff he, in he, several of uh, these movies. He uh, was the uh, uh, stock footage guy in Ed Wood. Yeah, he's 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 a go-to old man in a lot of movies from like the eighties and nineties. He was really great. He was really uh, great. Air Bud for seventh inning fetch ends much like the last one with Air Bud at a professional sporting event, and he helps the Anaheim Angels win the World Series. He won the World Cup. Why not the World Series? Now here's the weird thing. Mm-hmm. This movie came out just a few months before the Anaheim Angels won the World Series. So it was prescient. I th- I think it's a marketing tie-in. <laughs> Because that is some weird shit. Because that doesn't happen very often. They're not the World Series winningest team. <laughs> They're really not. So if Disney hadn't made this film, then the Anaheim Angels would not have won the World Clearly Series. Clearly not. Yeah. I mean, obviously. I mean, that stands to reason. Ana- Anaheim, just to remind you, is where Disneyland is located. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's all coming together. And I was actually, that was the first time the Anaheim Angels had even gone to the World Series. So they were like, the odds wow. were really slim. <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, that's it's really, really weird. So I just love that that happened. I think that's just this bizarre historical mm. footnote that I don't think anyone talks about enough. Uh, and then lastly, we have Airbud Five or Airbud Colon Spikes Back. Not Airbud Spikes Back, but Airbud Colon 
spikes back. No, I think it's just Air Bud spikes back. I don't uh, think there's a colon in I, there. I've seen it with a colon, and it's right. weird. Air Bud, Air Bud spikes back. This is directed directed by the photographer from the first movie. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we talked to, talked about how he's a great photographer. This is his only directorial effort. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the plot of this one is uh, the girls are grown up. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, they are now in high school. Kevin Zegers is gone. He's Long since gone. Yeah. He made it, He was in the last one for a couple of scenes, mm. just to sort of have some emotional oomph. But now he's gone. The big drama of this one is that Tammy actually moves away. Her family moves to California, mm. and our protagonist was it Andrea. Was it Andrea? An- Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. Andrea uh, wants to go visit her, but she can't afford to, so she's taking on uh, babysitting and pet sitting jobs over the summer. Meanwhile. <sighs> This Justin Guarini looking dude uh, moves in next door <laughs> and he is into volleyball. Mm. And there's this whole bit where he teaches her to play volleyball. I'm like, she became a very formidable baseball player. Mm. She's, pro- I mean, I realize it's a new sport and she has to learn, but she's like acting like she's never done sports before. It feels out of character. <laughs> um, also, the kid would recognize Buddy. Buddy is the kind of be one of the most famous dogs in America, at the very least. He's, he's got to be the only thing of interest in Fernfield, Washington. Yeah, I mean, like, you'd think. It, it, it hasn't been that long. It's been, like, what, five years, I think, since the first movie? Well, in first continuity? Was, I guess in so, continuity. Yeah. Uh, Well, let's see. Because this little sister was a baby in the first one. Oh, so Jesus. It's, so so it's the actually, dog's actually pretty so it's, old. It's been about 15 years. That, that's an old dog, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an old dog. That's that dog is probably shouldn't a, be uh, playing man, volleyball. Man, super DNA, man. The dog doesn't age. It's uh, the dog is already one thousand years old, and it's seen <laughs> some stuff, man. It's an aw- no wonder they tried to make that super <laughs> sports chain. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so if they win the volleyball tournament, she gets a free trip to California to visit Tammy. Okay, that's 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 what's in it for her. They want to. She wants to see her best friend again. That's actually yeah. kind of sweet. That's nice. That's fine. Yeah. It's it's harmless. Um, and, uh, meanwhile, there are two dopey jewel thieves who are trying to kidnap Air Bud because, uh, Andrea's younger brother, who's very annoying. I uh, hate that kid. It's not, I, I don't blame the kid, but man, they did not get a good child actor for it. They didn't get a good child actor for it. Yeah, it's just, it's just, he has the, the no cho- presence. Look, he's, he sounds choice, like he's yelling his, all his lines. The, the choice that they chose, that they made to make this character as obnoxious as they possibly could, mm-hmm. was not a good one because they were successful. <laughs> <laughs> they they wanted him to be you know as grating as possible, and he was, yeah. and not just for the other characters, but for us as well. Yeah, he he is. He's just he's just this loud, obnoxious kid who just gets everything he ever wants. Like he, 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 makes eats, my, he eats ice cream all summer. He makes my teeth hurt just watching yeah. this kid. It's oh my like I want to smack the child. So the kid had trained Buddy to do an obstacle course for some sort of carnival, and uh, mm-hmm. the obstacle course is what a kawinky dink exactly what the jewel thieves need to go through in order to steal a diamond. So they kidnap Buddy, and Buddy does the thing, and bloody bloody blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing about this whole movie that I could even remotely get behind. Mm. Not because I, I've seen worse. There's just nothing to it. It's just a lot of nothing. Uh, but Edie McClurg shows cool. up. The wonderful Edie McClurg. She, she shows up as Andrea's grandmother. Edie McClurg, I think most people know her as uh, the receptionist slash secretary in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Mm. That's like her big scene-stealing role. But if you know her from that, you know you've seen her in a whole bunch of things. And she's done a lot of cartoon voices as well. A lot she has of a great cartoon voice. voices. Mm. She plays a lot of moms and grandmothers. Mm. And she's a very reliable, She was, she was the villain actor. in the Elvira, in the first Elvira movie. She was! Yeah. I love that. You're mm. right. She was great. Um, she brings a lot of genuineness to her mm. role as that grandmother. She clearly <laughs> loves those kids. There's a bit where when they kidnap the dog, they also kidnap her parrot. And, you know, her husband isn't there anymore. Whoever mm. whoever uh, uh, grandfather was is gone. So she's alone. And there's this moment where she suddenly she's talking to her parrot and she realizes her parent isn't there. Wow. Her, she has no parrot. And, like, she's like, oh. And I, my heart actually broke a little because Amy McClurg <laughs> is a good actor. Like, she actually just sold that moment. And she's, like, really, really good in it. And, uh, yeah, the rest of the movie is just... <laughs> just... <laughs> well, so we, we had Kevin Zegers having a romance with, like, the British uh, exchange student. And, and mm-hmm. she's forgotten about in the following film. Yeah, I think I, I assume they moved away again. Yeah, she, yeah. well, she's an exchange student. She went back to back home. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, 
their relationship was like it seemed a little more even handed. This was like mm. a, a teenage girl like fawning over the really obnoxious broody skater dude. But he's got nothing, and he's got no. Yeah, he, he has no, no charm, no no charisma. Like, he's, he's fine. He's just the, not playing the that act, cool kid. The actress who played the British exchange student, she wasn't a great actress, but she had a lot of like on screen on screen charm, and she had a lot of chemistry yeah. with Kevin. Zegers. She was certainly very likable. This yeah. kid, and again, I'm not even picking on the kid. It's just. If they were trying to get that sort of heartthrob mm-hmm. uh, uh, vibe, he's not the kid for it. He's mm-hmm. just way too laid back. There's really nothing about he. Honestly, like she, it's, they don't really push a lot of romance, which I appreciated. Uh-huh. But like you can tell that that's kind of what they wanted to eke out of that relationship, and it just sounds like. He likes volleyball, and, like, that's literally it. He has mm. no other interest. He's nice enough, but that's all he cares about. Yeah. And she is just kind of using him to get a free trip to California. <laughs> and that's fine, too, yeah, because they, yeah. there's nothing else going on. It would be so, a better story if, like, she ended up liking this guy, even though she was just using him to, well, you know, usual romantic comedy stuff. I'm yeah. using you to get my goal, but I fall in love with you anyway. Uh, uh, well, I guess that's no less. These that's movies that's are, a real cliche. These movies are super bland. And I understand, yeah. that, you know, they're made up by Disney. They're straight to video films. They're supposed to be things you accumulate at the checkout line while you're getting your groceries. Yeah, this'll this'll keep the kids quiet or, or, tonight. Or the kid like slips it into your groceries without you noticing and before you know it, you own seventh inning fetch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we better watch it. And uh yeah, there's there's no beyond the first two maybe. The the first movie and like the forty the good forty five minutes of the second movie. There's no personality to these movies whatsoever. There's n- the the idea has been done. The dog plays basketball. Where can you really go? It just plays other sports. So what? It's the same story. You know what they never did, and this weirds me out because it's the obvious move if you mm. want to like inject like a new life into at least one of the other movies. Mm. Why doesn't any? Why don't any of the other teams get a dog? Or another animal of some kind. Yeah, why, like, why is there no anti-bug? Like, <laughs> Horace the hate bug from yeah, the, the, the like there's no, 97 like, love bug movie. Like, I want to say that, oh, listen, they're kind of unstoppable because they got this dog and it kind of throws the entire dynamic off. We can't really train for that. Mm-hmm. What if we got a dog? No. That never occurs to any. I realize he's really well trained, but like even in the in the fifth movie, we find out there's another. It's like I forget it. It's like a border collie or something. Mm. But there's like another really well trained dog that the buddy competes with in that obstacle course. Mm. Get that dog. And it that dog play, probably has a grudge can, against Buddy. He can, lost that obstacle course. Probably played volleyball. Why not? Why not? The volleyball is the one sport I actually buy a dog playing because it can just bounce the ball. It's that's just, all it needs to all, do. The, yeah. the balls aren't super heavy. You know what? It goes up against a seal. <laughs> The other team has a seal in the volleyball tournament. I like it. And and the seal is bitter because the seal can't jump. (laughs) But it can bounce that ball much better, and there's a rivalry. I like it. Now, that's the end of the Air Bud series. However, Mm. others are rumored to exist. And I'm not kidding. I know. I have not found these movies anywhere. I don't think they actually I've only exist. found vague evidence and reference. You know, it's like it's like when you're studying an ancient work of literature and you can tell that the author is referring to something that's been lost. I yeah. feel like the, well, these things have been lost to history. Airbud Aussie Rules from mm-hmm. 2008, where Airbud plays rugby. I don't know what's in it. I, I think that's just a rumor. And, and also Kevin Zegers is back in it for some reason. We'd have to talk to him to find out. I don't think that's real. Air Bud the Big Puck. <laughs> 2009, Air Bud plays hockey. The Apocrypha of Air Bud. <laughs> there, there, there are apocryphal books of the Air Bud gospel. <laughs> and then in 2010, there was Air Bud colon all fours where he plays golf. I don't know where the term all fours enters into golf lexicon, but evidently that's... Oh, no, 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 because like four... But that's F-O-R-E, and this is... Well, oh, right. but he's on all fours. All he's a, all, well, it should be F-O-R-E-S. I don't all know. Fours. It's not... It doesn't really work, does it? I think that's why they changed the franchise, is they started running out of uh, sports puns. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, come on, we can come up with sports puns right now. Okay, for do do- it. Dogs, come up with a better one for dog, fucking golf. For golf. Um... <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mudding green. Instead of mutt, he's a mutt. Mutting, mutting green. There you go. Yeah. I'll take it. It's not great. <laughs> it's, 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 we can workshop that. Yeah. We play with that a little bit. <laughs> 
four leg iron, four legged iron, no, four that's, iron. That, no, that that's make that's any a bad sense. one. That's, that's yeah. terrible. <laughs> You're right. I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in the corner. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can't come up with one one for golf. Yeah, it, it's, like, it's harder. It's harder mm. than it's. Listen, if you make fun of these movies, remember people made a lot of money off of these things. Mm. They're dumb. They're cheesy. They were successful. Ke- Kevin Zegers is still working. Yeah, yeah. He was in that Shadowhunters movie. Was he? He was. No shit. Yeah, he had a supporting role. Okay, that, good for him. But like, no, like these these movies, they brought a lot of joy to a lot of kids, and they're harmless. Even mm. the bad ones. Like, I'll, I'll make fun of them a little bit. No, that that little brother, man, that's a harmful but, but experience. That's, but that's not it's like teaching the little kids that it's okay to be that obnoxious. It's not harmful. That's not. It's, but even so, I've seen so many worse versions of it than that. No, right. These are just kind of disposable pablum, and but it takes some effort to make this kind of movie and mm. getting five movies out of the same stupid concept <laughs> is pretty impressive actually mm. like because- i've seen some of the air buddies movies and they just gave up on that and started just doing anything mm. and once and, and that's totally uh, now re- they're pirates yeah. now there's ghosts why not yeah and like listen that's very liberating but like the air Bud movies had to work within a very rigid construct mm. and Bless them, they got five movies out of it. I'm actually impressed. I, I would have blown my brains out after the third. <laughs> like, like, you wanted to play what now? <laughs> like, I can't do it. Baseball again? Oh, jeez. Why is he called Air Bud? Air, that's, that's a basketball term, but he's still Air Bud Baseball? That doesn't make any sense. Can he be Cleat Bud? <laughs> Just call it Cleat Bud. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> one last thing about Airbud Spikes Back. I just want to say one thing. This is, this is the thing. This is the thing. This is this is the thing that honestly I was just like, and I'm I'm so glad we're done. Mm. It takes fifty five minutes to get Airbud playing volleyball in that movie. The first That's... one you build to it because it's a dramatic thing. Mm. After that, just get the dog just in get the him game. On the field, yeah. He's right there. We know who that dog. Like no one should be surprised that they, the dog is playing volleyball. They right should now. in the first. There should be a montage at the opening of the fifth movie. Can you? Can you? play croquet no okay can you play you know just try different sports can you curl well, can you ski they jump they should have ended yeah. in like 22 jump street where it's just a montage of every Airbud movie we're never gonna see <laughs> just screw it yeah. Airbud shuffleboard why not <laughs> Airbud the luge yeah Airbud ski ball <laughs> that that you know that's that's coming yeah okay Airbud ski ball yeah Airbud versus cool runnings <laughs> That's actually a good idea. It'd have to be like Airbud versus Soccer Dog, which is another franchise. Airbud versus Most Valuable Primate. It's from the, the ma- same studio, actually, so that's possible. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Shit. MVP, Most Valuable Primate. I tried to watch... Uh, uh, and there's three of those. There's three or four of those, actually, of the chimp. So there's Most Valuable Primate, where yeah. he plays hockey. There's Most Vertical Primate, where he skateboards, and then there's... Yeah. Most extreme M- primate. MXP, most extreme primate. There's at least three of those. There's also one, I tried to watch this one, man, and I could not get through <laughs> ten minutes of it. Russell Madness, about a Jack Russell Terrier who mm. wrestles. It was supposed to be Russell Mania, and from I, what I, I recall. From what, the story but the Russell is Mania that, people wouldn't let, you, let, the, let them have the, the name. The story is they wouldn't let him, let him have it. But yeah, that, that, movie is a, that movie is... If you think the Airbud movies are bad, try watching Russell Madness and just see how hard it is to unlock that <laughs> The Airbud movies are a puzzle box that has have, have been solved time and again, and we should be grateful for the hard work that went into these things. And when you solve them, the ghost of Kevin, Kevin DeChico comes out and like <laughs> rips your flesh <laughs> like a Hellraiser. <laughs> so that's Airbud. Uh, and we end on a Hellraiser. I don't. I Thank d- you, ladies and gentlemen. Seriously, like if you want to like pour through the Airbud movies. I don't recommend it, but the first one's fine. Like the first mm. one, if you like, it's is a babysitting tool. You know, mm. you get you hanging out with your nieces and nephews. You got to put something on. Airbud's fine. The f- the first Airbud. First Airbud is fine. Yeah. Avoid the rest. The, even the even the ones that are okay. Like the third one's okay. They were it's not great. They're just exploitation. They're trying to get the kid dollar. It's a yeah. recognizable name. Don't fall for it. Mm. We'll do the Air Buddies films eventually. Yeah. If you if you vote for it, uh, the next next month we already had our poll up on Schmoville, the Schmoville fan page, mm. uh, for next month's, and uh, it was our runner up last time, and now it's uh, come to the foreground. We will be doing Highlander. Mm-hmm. At the end of December, so that'll be fun. And there's more of those than you might think. Uh, there's quite a few, actually, mm-hmm. a couple of different versions of them as well, which we'll try to do both of. Um, so we got that, uh, and uh, also our next poll uh, will be up on Schmoville by the time this episode goes live. It is for next week's bad movie, and we'll find a good movie to pair with it. And your choices will be Clock Stoppers, 
Second place from last time always uh, gets held over. Yeah. Clockstoppers did pretty well. Let's see if they can hold it, up against the it, next competition. It doesn't mean other ones won't come back, however. We're just oh, trying, no. trying to keep variety. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you got excited about it, maybe you'll have a chance this time. If not, yeah. well, come back. Right. Uh, all your other options are Johnny Mnemonic, starring uh, Keanu Reeves and Dolph Lundgren as a homeless homicidal preacher. And, and, Her- and Henry Rollins. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, and Biodome is another one of your options. Mm-hmm. Polly Shore and Stephen Baldwin. Which one's Stephen Baldwin? He's the one who was in the Biodome. Ah, okay. Uh, that we've, guy. We've got Barb Wire starring the great Pamela Anderson. Uh, and we've got Hansel and Gretel, Warriors of Witchcraft. Not to be confused with Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters. Oh, no, 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 no. That was the A feature. Yeah, no, this is the straight-to-video one, directed by the legendary David Dakota, who has had the longest and maybe least illustrious career of any director ever. (laughs) We've had him on our show before, on our previous podcast. He's actually really delightful, and he is under no illusions of what he does. Yeah. But, like... He he knows he makes crap. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he enjoys every second of it, and bless him for it. Uh, But, yeah, I have not seen that one. That was one of the requests we got, and uh, that sounds like a hell of a thing. So you can I hope vote for that. If I you hope want. you do that because I I could go on for days about David Dakota. And the his over movies. of David. Uh, there was a while when I actually. Oh, should I say this? No, I'm never going to do it. Uh, I was there was a while when I actually wanted to do a podcast that was just going to be me reviewing every week. And if I could get David Dakota to do commentary, I would. Mm-hmm. Just every episode was a different David Dakota movie. It was going to be called Decoding Dakota. D, D small e big C decoding. Yeah. Decoding, like you're decoding um, an encryption. Dakota. Dakota. D- 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 no d- one would have listened, but I would have had a good time. David Dakota's did 250 movies. It would have been easy. It would. Oh yeah, we never would have gone material. on and on and on. Yeah, he'd, we'd, we'd we'd come back next week, and he would have directed another movie. It's insane. <laughs> um, just, just one. <laughs> so we've got some letters, but before we do, we want to we're going to burn through the second half oh, yeah, have, of um, our catch ups, our lightning round. So uh, t- just to catch you up, this is episode three, critically uh-huh. claimed. Yep. Um, in since starting critically Accla- or before we started critically acclaimed, we were doing a, a podcast called the B Movies Podcast. Yeah. Uh, thank you for fans for finding us again. If you're new, welcome. Uh, but a lot but of our old we listeners, were out, we were out uh, out of the podcasting game for a few months there, and we continued to watch and review films just in no uh, podcast form. We want to make sure we get all of them. Yeah. <laughs> just to, to bridge the gap. We had a lot of people product. asking us to review uh, what we mm-hmm. missed. Uh, and uh, for those of you who, uh, you know, are, are new, it'll give you a, a quick overview of our taste. Uh, mm-hmm. We got to uh, the end of September, and now we're mm-hmm. going to get through uh, October and the first bit of November. These are all new release movies. Mm-hmm. That came out in that time that we saw and didn't get a chance to review. And we're going to do them as quickly as we can yeah. because there's still 24 <clears throat> left. So we'll go quick. Okay, real fast. Blade Runner 2049. Uh, I think how much you like this movie is going to depend on how much you like the original or whether or not you saw it. Mm. If you didn't like it or if you didn't see it, it's going to be a pretty impenetrable. But, 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 you can, impenetrable. <laughs> I think it'll be pretty impenetrable, but I do love the original, mm. especially the, the uh, director's cut. Uh, and I thought this version was A, gorgeous, and B, a very, very clever way to preserve a lot of the mysteries of the original and add a whole bunch of new ones that raise interesting questions. Uh, it's a little obtuse, but that's Blade Runner, and I mm. expect that from Blade Runner, and I like that from Blade Runner. Mm. I think it is pretty spectacular. No, I'm no fan of the original. I've seen seen the original a couple times, and just it has never connected with me. I don't just don't like it. And mm. so seeing the second one, I do appreciate a lot of the visual stuff, just like in the original, but but I think it's in service of kind of a boring story. I think the pace is way too slow. Mm-hmm. I think the mysteries are really obvious. And uh, it's just n- was not enjoyable to watch. It's just really, really boring. Fair enough. My Little Pony the movie. Only I saw Didn't this one. This one. Uh, I've seen My Little Pony the show. I actually quite like the, the recent revival of My Little Pony the show. I think it's a sweet story about uh, solving problems through diplomacy. So I didn't particularly care for the theatrical version, which was way more action-oriented, and it solved yeah. with a lot of fighting and I felt like they made a lot of storytelling decisions that kind of only make sense if you don't watch the show a lot because it's all about oh we got to get this magical thing but we have this other magical thing that we've already established that we have <laughs> and we never even try it and it's a little weird even letting that go it's just kind of standard in a way that even the show isn't and mm. I don't particularly care for it okay. I know a lot of uh, fans of the show are really positive on this movie fine 
I disagree on this one. I, I don't think it's the show at its best. Uh, Cult of Chucky. Did you see Cult of Chucky? I did see Cult, Cult of Chucky. Uh, okay. This is the uh, seventh in the series. Sixth? Seventh. Seventh. Seventh in this series. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot more directly connected to the previous film, uh, Curse of Chucky. Yeah, which was really good. Which was really good. Uh, we call, follow the lead character from that last film, played by Fiona Dorif. Brad Dorif's daughter, coincidentally, they, they had no idea when they cast her. Weird. So they claim. And uh, she's been sent to a mental institution and where she's being stalked by Chucky, or is it that other Chucky? Like, there are several Chucky dolls, and we're not sure which one is the evil Chucky. Yeah, they bring in, like, a Chucky <clears throat> doll in... Uh, As a therapy device. Uh, yeah, see, yeah. see, there's nothing wrong with it, but maybe it is Chucky, or maybe the other Chucky doll they got running around is mm. Chucky. There's some actually really cool surprises in this movie. Oh, yes. I really think... And they're kind of clever, too. There's, no, there's... They, uh, uh, Don Mancini, who's been writing the series since forever and directed, mm. like, the last three installments, um, he's always trying to find new ways to do interesting stuff with this weird little beast he's created. Mm -hmm. And I think... I think Curse of Chucky was a better overall film. It's got more consistent tone and, mm. and characters. Um, this one's just got a lot of wild personality to it, and I would totally, if you have any affection for the franchise, you should see it. Yeah, for sure. It's really cool. I think it, it's, it, maybe it's... I, I like it better than Seed of Chucky. Oh, which definitely. Is just, you know, nonsense comedy. Yeah, sometimes it's really scary, sometimes it's really funny, sometimes those things don't gel well, but it's quite good, and I and I do recommend yeah, and, it. And, you know, Jennifer Tilly's back, which is great. Oh, and, she's and, great. and there are some queer underpinnings to this, which I really appreciate. So, oh, yeah. 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 Um, which which I, I don't want to say what they are because it would give stuff away. But yeah, yeah but they, they play with the idea of uh, mm. various different identities. And uh, um, I think it's fantastic. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's certainly worth seeing. Um, then there's uh, Happy Death Day, which was the <laughs> slasher Groundhog Day, mm. uh, where a sort of entitled sorority girl who only thinks of herself uh, is killed at the end of every day and then wakes up at the beginning of that day and has to figure out what the hell's going on and mm. how to save her own life. Sol solve her murder by the end of the day before yeah. she gets killed again. It sounds like a terrible idea. It's really good. No, it's actually kind of a clever idea. Uh, you know, m murder over and over again, the Groundhog Day thing, but with slasher. That's a good idea. That's well, a good elevator pitch. There seems like there's and a couple of downsides to it. Maybe there's not enough suspense because the day keeps restarting. Mm. They find some ways around that, I think, which are pretty clever. I'm not going to ruin mm. them for you. Um, and uh, yeah, you could just say to yourself, oh, they're just doing Groundhog Day, but who cares? It's very well made. It's funny. I it's, think the, it's exciting. A lot of it hinges on the strength of the lead actress. She's mm -hmm. really great. She plays the entitled jerk really well, but she's charming enough that you kind of root for her redemption. So, there you yeah, go. It's, it's actually quite good. All right. Uh, next up, Marshall, which I think only I saw. I did not see Marshall. Uh, Marshall, we mentioned it earlier in the podcast. Uh, it is the story of... Uh, um, uh, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, Thurgood Marshall. Before he was a Supreme Court justice, uh, he was... Uh, yeah, he was an actual trial lawyer, and it's the story of one of his more interesting cases the problem is it's really not interesting enough like the 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 acting is good the I, the premise is great the case itself feels like a law and order episode more than it does a movie hmm. and i think that's kind of to the film's detriment i think if they had found a more dynamite case or maybe if they had the freedom to make it a bit more melodramatic even than it is <laughs> uh which it is plenty melodramatic it's a serious crime hmm. and everything but like yeah, I don't know. It never quite pops, I think, the way it needs to. But it's well made, and I think it's definitely worth seeing some time uh, if you have any interest in the premise. How's Chadwick Boseman? He's always great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. Problem solved. Uh, Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman. Uh, Did, didn't see this one either. Uh, it's another biographical film about the creator slash creators of Wonder Woman uh, who lived in an open relationship. It was... Mm -hmm. uh, 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 man and woman married, brought another woman into the relationship. Uh, together, they helped invent the lie detector, which is true. <laughs> uh, and their interest in um, power dynamics and particularly in sexual role play had a significant influence on how Wonder Woman was conceived as a character. Um, whenever it's dealing with the relationship dynamics, the movie is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The acting is great. Uh, and I highly recommend it for that. Whenever it foreshadows Wonder Woman, it gets a little clunky. Hmm. Um, much not not maybe not quite man who invented Christmas or uh, magic beyond words of J.K. Rowling story clunky, <laughs> but I feel like that hand gets oversold a bit. But yeah, when it comes yeah. to a uh, uh, dramatization of an unconventional romance, it's 
pretty exciting and it's very well made and okay. I would recommend it. Uh, you're you're the only person who I've talked to have, who've been saying good things about this. I've, I've heard a lot of bad things. I've about heard this a lot film. of people say good things, so yeah. I guess it's pretty mixed. But I'm I'm definitely positive on it, right. even though it does have some problems. Uh, there is a straight to I think it was straight to VOD movie called The Archer, which is a pretty cool little fugitive movie. It's about a young uh, uh, a high school student who is an archery uh, uh, competition winner, and she is screwed over by the justice system she's this other young girl she's in love with is being abused by her boyfriend she ends up beating the crap out of that guy hmm. her mother not knowing anything about the legal system cops a plea deal and she ends up in one of these um you know uh, what, do, what do you call it these prison? penal it's prison but it's it's like a private prison oh, okay so like the more people they have there the more money they make and so they're kind of well, working the system to make sure that's they have as many as they can mo- most prisons but yeah i know and uh she finds out about corruption there and she goes on the run with nothing but a bow and arrow and a whole bunch of of, of horrible oh. men chasing her it's pulpy but it's actually really good and for it's as good as that probably mm. can be um and i actually highly recommend it if that sounds at all appealing to you okay. it's, it's it's pretty solid and i really really like the character work in particular. Uh, tell me about Geostorm. <laughs> Must I? Please. Uh, Geostorm is just as stupid as you've heard. Uh, Yay! It's, it's, it's a r- rip-off of the Roland Emmerich mold where we get to see the, the worlds just coming up. Coming well, to wasn't pieces. that done it's by the, Dean Devlin? Didn't he help by, create the, Dolan, the Roland Emmerich mold? Dean Devlin, who yeah, okay. worked with uh, Roland Emmerich. Okay. Uh, it takes place in the near future where climate change has gone so wild that we've launched a series of satellites that control the weather. But they're screwing up and things are getting through and it turns out there's some shadowy conspiracy to shut down the network and that would unleash what they call the geostorm and there's a big (laughs) red clock counting down to when the geostorm will begin and of course gerard butler is there and and gerard butler is running around like on earth and then on a satellite trying to find out what this shadowy conspiracy is about the potential geostorm and he's sending secret codes to jim sturgis who is his brother and uh, uh oh gosh what's her name from sucker punch abby cornish oh okay abby cornish who's his brother's paramour and they are a. Uh, like it the, sounds the three, awesome. It, the, the three, these three people are like racing against the clock to undo like this big super technological net that's around the planet. And there's a lot of, you know, when the geostorm happens, there's like fire tornadoes and sharknadoes. Everything and about it sounds else. awesome. Is it awesome? Uh, it is way fun to watch, but it is stupid as all get out. It is <laughs> just as stupid as it sounds. Okay, great. Uh, let's see what we got here. Mm. Uh, the snowman. Did you see the snowman? I didn't see the snowman. Okay, so the snowman. But I heard the snowman was secretly the geostorm. <laughs> The Snowman is actually based on a series of very successful uh, uh, detective novels, of which my wife is actually a big fan, and she left the theater hating this movie. <laughs> Apparently, all personality got drained out of it. Um, I, I haven't read the book, so I can't attest to it. All I can say is it's a, about a serial killer who builds snowmen outside the houses of the people he's going to murder. Mm. Um, it's which around Christmas time. That's well, it, it takes place in easy. like Sweden, so it's like it's oh, kind yeah. of or, or one of those like it, what are, what are it, those Scandinavian. It, countries? Here's the thing, though. It's like it's really classy. It's from the director of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. It's got oh, a good okay. cast, and and yet it out of my head completely because it just hits mm. all of the cliches. Mm. Like it doesn't make you want to see more adventures of this detective. Like it's just really generic, uh. by the numbers, not very interesting stuff. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's one of the worst movies of the year. It's not. It's just one of the blandest. It's mm. just meh, I, I don't recommend it. Uh, Only the Brave. Did you see that? Uh, no. Uh, this is actually it's kind of surprised me. It is uh, from Joseph Kaczynski, who did Oblivion and Tron Legacy, and it is the story of a group of real-life uh, firefighters. They fight wildfires and protect uh, cities from rage- raging fires in the forests. And uh, it stars Josh Brolin and Miles Teller and uh, Taylor Kitsch. Taylor Kitsch? Yeah, Taylor Kitsch. Um, and uh, it's good. It's yeah. just well-made. It's right. It's kind of... I didn't know the story, so the ending kind of surprised me. If you do know the story, the ending won't surprise you. But it's well acted. It's very earnest. It's gorgeously photographed. Um, you know, it's it's not going to blow your mind, perhaps, but it's very well made for what it is. So I would I would recommend that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Killing of the Sacred Deer. I did see this. Tell me about the Killing of a Sacred this Deer. This is uh, the Yorgos Lanthimos film. The guy who did The Lobster and Dogtooth and really dark, dour films about you know cynicism and the darkness of the human condition and uh, it's about a 
a doctor who has taken a young man under his wing for reasons that first we don't know. Uh, and this young man's a teenager. He seems a little off. He communicates strangely, and he has everyone really st- kind of communicates strangely. In his well, movies, I guess so. It's hard they to they, tell they all talk, ta- but yeah, he everybody seems a little wrong, and the, the way they converse seems really forced. And it, it's eventually revealed what the true nature of the relationship is between the boy and the doctor, who's played by Colin Farrell. Uh-huh. And they're essentially something horrible is now put on the family of the doctor, and they the family has to start making some really horrible decisions to deal with these horrible things that are happening. I'm sorry I have to be vague. You do have to be vague on this one. You do not want to ruin this But movie. yeah, there's there, there's this one speech in the middle where uh, the, the boy explains exactly what's going to happen, but we don't know why that thing's going to happen. And they it don't just, explain how it's happening, uh, yeah. but it does, and it is really creepy, it's actually. It's super and duper creepy. I really admire this movie as, because I wasn't a huge fan of The Lobster. I got it. I just mm. felt like it was kind of like a Monty Python sketch that got out of hand. Like, <laughs> but, but That's why I liked it, but yeah. But I think, I think uh, with this thriller dynamic, mm. um, he's really creating this sort of weird world of family and then picking it apart and just showing just how tenuous all of our connections mm. really, really are. It, it's it, really it, scary. I it think it's one of the better yeah, horror movies of the year. In a heightened state of desperation, when the, the the mechanic is robbed mm-hmm. where you're just, you just know you're facing down some sort of horror, just how quickly decorum falls away. Yeah. And that's what Yorgos Lanthimos is about. Just destroying decorum. Yeah, I, I, it's mm. probably going to make my top 10 of the year. It's, really it's quite one. good. Uh, I saw jungle starring Daniel Radcliffe in which Daniel Radcliffe is in a jungle. He plays a jungle. Sure. Uh, he, he's uh, uh, backpacking through South America, and he gets separated from the rest of his uh, hikers. They're off to find some magical city of blah. And uh, <laughs> he gets stuck, and he goes mad in the jungle, and some gross things happen. Will he survive or won't he? It's okay. <laughs> it takes way too long to get to the survival element of it. Like, I feel like if it had managed to, like, strand Daniel Radcliffe in the jungle within, like, 30 minutes and then spend an hour there and then mm-hmm. left, probably would have been a pretty tight, well-crafted survival thriller. As it stands, it's it's just badly structured. Um, if you like survival thrillers, it's certainly worth watching. There's some good stuff in it. But mm-hmm. if not, it's, it's not worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, 1922, the uh, other Stephen King Netflix adaptation this year. <laughs> Didn't see that one either. Uh, it's not Gerald's game. There you go. This one stars Thomas Jane as a f- uh, as a farmer in 1922, um, and his wife is threatening to divorce him, and he convinces their son to help him kill the mom so that she won't take the land away from them. And, of course, that was the wrong thing to do, and there is a whole bunch of comeuppance. Um, it feels like it probably would have been an amazing Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode. There's, like, a really good hour-long version of this, but uh, when you stretch it out to feature length, it's just not doing anything terribly new. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've not seen a lot of stories about just, you know, people committing murder and, you know, bad things happening to them as a result, um, it's okay. It's certainly fine. It just doesn't bring anything new to the <laughs> what genre. What say? Just people committing murder. Yeah. Left and right. Uh, did you see Wheelman? I, no, I have not seen uh, Wheelman. Wheelman is another Netflix original. stars Frank Grillo. Uh, he is always a captivating presence. He plays a, uh, a getaway driver who, in the middle of the latest crime, is called on the phone and threatened and told to abscond with the money before the uh, guys mm-hmm. can get in the car. And now he is driving around town with a lot of stolen items, stolen goods. And basically, it's just him. It's basically like that Tom Hardy movie, Lock. It's just him on the phone occasionally in a car chase. Nice. Um, which sounds a little better than it is. It's got a lot of padding. It's another one that probably oh, should have yeah. been a lot shorter. Um, it's interesting, and if that sounds appealing to you, if you like that kind of playing with the genre, and you like a, a and you've seen a lot of car chase movies, and you want to see someone do something slightly different with it, it's okay. It just mm-hmm. never quite sings. Uh, tell me about Amityville: The Awakening. <laughs> Must I? Yes. Um, Amityville: The Awakening is one of those notoriously shelved movies, and it's one of the biggest bombs of the year. Well, um, it is and it isn't. They, because though they made they made it several years ago. They put it on the shelf. They brought it out. They offered it for free on like. Like yeah. through iTunes and online streaming services, and then they put it in theaters. They put it anyway, in theaters and it made like five hundred dollars. It, it made like seven hundred and thirty-four dollars. Like, yeah, it's it's like one of the lowest grossing films of the year. But they had already uh, if they if they hadn't put it out for free, maybe more people would have, or at least on VOD, yeah, maybe, maybe more people would have gone. But but uh, it, this one stars Bella Thorne, a talented young, ac- young actress who moves into the Amityville house. But in this version of the Amityville story, not only is the Amityville haunting true and the events of the first film are true, but it 
those movies also exist. Like the characters watch the Amityville movies. So it's well, like, I mean, the Amityville house is a real house. Yeah, so I guess they're trying to. It's kind of they're they, they're fudging a lot of the continuity, and mm. it's it's actually really typical. There's just a lot of the usual scenes of people wandering down dark hallways in the Amityville house. If you're interested in Amityville, we have enough. There's like twenty or thirty of these. You things You really at this only point. have to see the first two. The first, maybe the third, which is kind of nutty, but yeah. yeah, don't don't go to the one where the like the lamp starts creeping around in the attic. <laughs> Once you hit uh, evil lamp, you've run yeah. out of ideas. <laughs> oh I have an God. idea. It's a lamp, and all of the haunting is in a lamp. Yeah, that's a terrible idea. Make it. <laughs> <laughs> Just how soon? But can make we have it, it make out? it for TV, and don't address the corpse that's hidden in the floor. I've Understood. seen all, I've seen all those movies. Too. Uh, okay, uh, Tragedy yeah. Girls is a new horror comedy uh, starring. Uh, 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 it's about two young teenage girls who mm. decide to become serial killers so that they can... To, to promote their brand. Yeah, to promote themselves on social media as people who are against serial killers. Uh, there's also a subplot in which they kidnap an actual serial killer to teach them how to do stuff, mm. but that's the only part that feels kind of forced. Other than that, this well, is which a is pretty... weird because it's the inciting incident. But yeah, yeah, it feels like that's like a different movie. You didn't really need it. Whatever, I, I don't really care. It's actually a really sharp, funny, dark comedy. Uh, it's, well, very, it's it's very it's mu- much about how these two girls relate and yeah. kind of how their friendship is actually really important to them and the way they relate and how they do kind of move apart and how friendship really moves. They just happen to be serial killers. Yeah, they happen to be horrible human beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it stars, um, oh, I want to give them shout outs, Brianna Hildebrand from Deadpool mm-hmm. and Alexandra Ship from X-Men Apocalypse. She played mm-hmm. Storm. Uh, this is a great role for both of them. They're really funny. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that if you're looking for something in the Better Off Dead and Heather's high mm-hmm. school mold with some uh, horror elements, there's like a lot of gore. <laughs> Uh, it, it's great. This is actually there's a really, like, really like great. Severed heads comedy. and stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty, it. pretty bloody. Tell me about Wonderstruck. Wonderstruck is the new Todd Haynes film, and it's a love letter to museums. Uh, it t- there's two simultaneous stories going on. There's a young boy in the '70s who doesn't know anything about his father because his mother won't tell anything, uh, tell him anything about him, and. Uh, he loses his hearing in a, like a lightning accident and decides to run off to New York where he knows his father might be and ends up wandering around the Natural History Museum. Uh, meanwhile, a generation earlier, we have a black and white story with no sound about a deaf girl who also goes to New York, tries to find her estranged mother, who's played by Julianne Moore, and she also ends up in the Natural History Museum. And we get to see sort of a lot of the stories playing out in two different timelines simultaneously and how simply being in this museum really creates kind of a kinship between all of the people who visit there. And huh. the stories do come together. I'm not going to tell how, but... It really does sort of have this magic ascribed to what a museum is trying to do in preserving knowledge and human history and how personal that can be. It's really kind of beautiful, and I think it's a great, great film for kids. Great. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jigsaw, the latest film in the Saw series, mm. and the worst film in the Saw series. <laughs> it's, it's like the most disposable one. Well, it's just, it, it, it's so frustrating, because the, this series came out about one a year for mm. about seven years. Mm. and Exactly seven years. There were seven films. Yeah. This is the eighth. Uh, I think I might have taken one short break in there like nope, no every year really? just consistent yeah. all right well, i'll let it go but uh my point is is that the thing with the saw movies is that they were more or less consistent the kills were always fun even mm-hmm. if the plot got completely incomprehensible it was it was com- incomprehensible from the first there was a flashback yeah. without a flashback in the first film <laughs> Um, but I, I actually really like the Saw franchise, mm-hmm. so I was really disappointed to see that this one just doesn't have any of the panache, any of the it showmanship. It doesn't have the wickedness. There, yeah. was, there was sort of a, a, a streak of cruelty that I think yeah. a lot of people reacted very negatively to about the Saw series that uh, I think other people ended up being their that. defining feature. Yeah. So, um, and it's basically kind of like, look what we can do. Look at this, all these clever ideas we have, and this new one kind of shies away from it. Most of the kills aren't that clever. There's one really spectacular one at the end. Mm-hmm. I'll give them that. There's a good one right at the end. And just like all the others, there is some weird twist in the chronology, so you're yeah. not really sure what is going it's, on when. But it's not particularly clever. It's a damn shame, because it's directed by the Spirit Brothers, who've done some really cool movies, like uh, Predestination, which is fantastic, <laughs> and uh, Daybreakers, which isn't fantastic, but is very clever. It's like an interesting it's, take on the horror, on the vampire genre. It's unique. I like it. It's not amazing, but it's cl- it's well, it's clever. It has ha- ideas. What happens to the world after the vampire apocalypse? Yeah, what happens when vampires take over, and now there's no one left to eat? 
neat idea. So what do you got? So uh, this one just doesn't have good ideas. It's really, really frustrating, and it doesn't even have their usual visual dynamism. So mm. I really didn't care for it, even as a fan of the others. Tell me about Suburbicon. Suburbicon is a film directed by George Clooney and written by the Coen brothers and features the worst qualities of both. Oh, uh, it, it is like just the most boring, non has no comment sort of satire that you've ever seen. It takes place in a town called Suburbicon. It's a 1950s suburb. Uh, Matt Damon plays the dad. Julianne Moore plays the wife and the aunt. Ooh. And uh, and there's a young son. And uh, the inciting incident for all of this is a black family moves into Suburbicon, which is all white. Mm-hmm. But that's simply the background. And all of like the racial animosity that's sort of bubbling up and how badly the black family is treated by all of the racist whites that live in Suburbicon is not it's not even a subplot it's just thing something that's happening next door while the main story goes on over here which involves Matt Damon and a home invasion and gangsters that are in his life and creepy uh like insurance investigators and it's just not an interesting story there's no real comment here there's no actual there's nothing that they have to say with this material mm-hmm. there's just sort of an interesting not even an interesting just sort of a weird crime plot that they decided to concoct there's a reason that the Coen brothers didn't want to make this they wrote the screenplay decades ago leave it on the shelf yeah. it's just a, com- a complete disappointment alright Thor Ragnarok nah. uh, everyone likes Thor Ragnarok mm. I liked it didn't love it um, it's obviously the latest it's, Marvel Studios it's film it's likable but not lovable yeah I, I, well there's stuff I love in it I love the production design mm. I love the music I love a lot of the presentation um, I love a lot of the characters individually i think thor and hulk are, are fun together yeah. and tessa thompson steals a lot of the movie as well as she should um my thing with the movie is a lot of people have accused marvel studios films of being too quote funny mm. and i think the issue isn't that they are funny i think the issue is that they undercut their drama mm. where they'll have a big dramatic beat and then they won't let us enjoy it because they cut to the next joke too fast and Thor Ragnarok is, suffers from that, I think, more than any other Marvel movie. Well, Anytime think, something serious happens, yeah. I can't take it seriously because it's followed by a gag. And I find that frustrating because there's a lot of things I would like to take seriously in it. There's a lot of really interesting stuff here. Some commentaries about colonialism and yeah. some decent, interesting ideas for family drama. And I just could never really connect to it emotionally, even though I was certainly entertained. I, I haven't liked the character of Thor until this film, actually. I feel like they finally were able to acknowledge how silly a lot of this was and just ran with the comedy. And I think that worked a lot better for the character. I think they did Loki right for the first time. Um, I liked the cast. There's too much padding. All of the stuff that takes place around the the second act is kind of dead weight. But there's this, an entire segment of the film that takes place on this bizarre garbage planet where people have gladiatorial fights. Yeah. And all of that is, it feels like a pinball machine, like the backboard of a pinball machine <laughs> come to life, complete with the Mark Mothersbaugh music. It, that part is all terrific. And I actually really found myself really loving that section. And I think if the, it was just 80 minutes of that, this would be a great film. Well, it feels like they kind of wrote themselves into a corner. It takes them like 25 minutes to get to the start of the movie yeah. because they left too many cliffhangers from other things without, clearly without really really planning what they were going to do next with them. Like, oh, oh, Loki's on the throne of Asgard. Clearly, that'll be a whole movie. No. Done in a scene! Yep, they just take care of it. And it's like it, it's frustrating because you want to think there's a plan, and there clearly isn't. Well, I feel like they, they, the, the series has been doing that a lot. It's like, oh no, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s disbanded. Oh, we're still together, so what? Yeah. We're back. Okay, that's it. But I, I <laughs> like that I didn't that. love it. I like that yeah. I didn't love it. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, the Light of the Moon is a great little drama that's flown under a lot of radars. Um, it stars Stephanie Beatrice is from Brooklyn Nine-Nine as a young woman who is attacked on her way home from work. Mm -hmm. Uh, She is uh, is sexually assaulted. And it's just basically her dealing with the aftermath of that. This isn't a revenge thriller. This is just her trying to piece together her life again, trying to figure out how to interact with her boyfriend now that a lot of their interactions have been sullied by a horrifying event, Uh, dealing with things like doctors and lawyers and Mm. cops and... There's something just incredibly engagingly uh, uh, exciting about how it just tells you, it it just shows you some reality of it. There's something just so real and intensely real about it without being uh, uh, forced, without Mm. being contrived in any way. That it, it, I mean, it, it doesn't sound entertaining, I'm sure, but it is valuable, and it is, I think, is really great drama. I think Stephanie Beatriz gives one of my favorite performances of the year in it. Uh, okay. So, um, if that sounds like the sort of thing you can handle, uh, I highly recommend it. Mm. Uh, it's a very, very good movie. Uh, Blade of the Immortal. 
This is Takashi Miike's 100th movie. Yeah, made one, directed 100 movies. It's insane. This is a complete about face. Uh, this is a story about an immortal badass who agrees to come out of retirement to help a little girl on her journey and along the way fights a bunch of guys. It's literally the plot of Logan. <laughs> but here's the thing. But in Blade, Japan. Well, Blade of, Blade of the Immortal is based on a manga series that has been going on for many, 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 many years. Uh, if anything, Logan probably owes more to Blade of the Immortal, at least the original, than the mm. other way around. Um it's cool. Like, it's very excitingly filmed. There's a lot of amazing, you know, sword fights and gore. And um, I, I actually like the way that they handle some of the morality of it. The idea that, um, you know, yeah, I'm a killer. I don't like it. <laughs> like, I actually have to deal with moral ramifications. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do any of this stuff, but I have to. And um, it's, 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 I've seen better versions of this, but this is a very good one. It's the first one we've had in a while. Hmm. I think so. If you're interested in an exciting, violent, uh, really intensely dramatic uh, samurai movie, Mm -hmm. uh, this is good. And I I would highly recommend it. Um, Two left. My Friend Dahmer. Uh, (laughs) I didn't see My Friend Dahmer. My Friend Dahmer is really good. It's really creepy, though. Mm -hmm. It is a story of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer in high school. Jeffrey Dahmer is, of course, one of America's most notorious serial killers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when he was in high school, he was friends with a guy who ended up becoming a cartoonist and wrote and wrote and drew a graphic novel about his high school relationship with Jeffrey Dahmer as two of the weird kids who pulled pranks and things and uh, how he missed a lot of red flags at the time. And I admired, I haven't read the book. Uh, I admire the movie for not letting him like off the hook. Yeah. Like every, there's a clearly Jeffrey Dahmer has a lot of serious problems that are not being addressed and people are missing it because they're only interested in themselves. Um, it's got a really great, uh, lead performance by, uh, what's his dude's name? Uh, Ross Lynch as Jeffrey Dahmer. It's very, very well crafted. Um, it's one of those movies where obviously we know where it goes. Yeah. And it never quite gets there. You know, it doesn't like take you all the way up to the all the really horrible things mm. he you, ever you did. Film that stuff. You, you, well, people have, and it's mm. very hard to digest. This is also hard to digest because we know where it goes from here, but it's just this sort of shroud over everything. And mm. it really makes you look back on your own past and make you wonder about people you knew and make you wonder people you know now, and maybe you should be reaching out more and trying to get people help. Mm. Um, so I think on some level it's it's very good drama. I think it's very creepy drama. And seriously, Ross Lynch gives a breakout performance. And lastly, we're almost caught up. Mm-hmm. I missed it. I know I need to see it because everyone tells me it's great. Tell me about Lady Bird. Lady Bird is the uh, is a, directed by Greta Gerwig, and it's semi autobiographical. It's about a young woman growing up in Sacramento, California, and she hates it, and she is a jerk about it. Uh, she's played by Saoirse Ronan, and. Uh, she goes to a Catholic school and she's cynical about everything and she uses her cynicism as a shield and as an identifying factor. And like a lot of coming of age films, uh, The Edge of Seventeen came immediately to mind. It's about a young woman who kind of learns that being genuine is actually more adult than being cynical. Yeah. And that's a hard that, lesson that, to learn for a lot of people, yeah. Especially for teenagers, because yeah. you you work so hard at being cynical, and it's so easy to be cynical that it you realize how difficult it is to be genuine. And there's a lot of trials, a lot of things that she has to go through, a lot of friendships she has to damage along the way, most notably the one with her mother, to ensure that she can leave Sacramento and go off to another college, and that's mm. her big ambition. Uh, it is wise, it is warm, it is really glorious, it's very smart about the way people behave, even when they're being bad to each other, we do get to see that, you know, why they're doing it and how kind of warm things kind of lurk underneath all of that. Mm. It It is really, really brilliant, and I love awesome. it. Well, we're all caught up, mm. thank God. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> I, I saw some other screeners, but we can get to those. Well, yeah, later, the, yeah, I've seen some stuff, too, that isn't out yet. Like, we'll get to that. Well, I, and I saw things that came out early in the year, but yeah, no, just, we're just recently. We're just talking so about that. Catch little, up, I didn't yeah. tell you about Lady Blood Fight, which I, is a female uh, remake, basically a remake of uh, Bloodsport. came out earlier this year. Oh, jeez. Um, the acting is mixed. Some of the actors are great. Some of them are not. Uh, as a fight movie, it's really cool. <laughs> like, I actually, if you just like fight movies and there aren't enough good ones anymore, uh, Lady Blood Fight. Check that out. It's actually a fun uh, a B movie. That's yeah. one uh, from. You want to recommend one from earlier in the year that we had? Uh, Lucky. See Lucky. Mm. The Harry, Harry Dean Stanton movie. Directed yeah. by John Carroll Lynch, where it's just about an old guy played by Harry Dean Stanton. He's in his 90s and he hangs around his tiny town and he badgers with his friends at the bar and he tries to figure out what it's like to be old. 
and what it means to be an old man in this remote place. Awesome. Yeah. Well, everyone loves Harry Dean Stanton. There's a lot of, so, yeah. lot of strange, down homey philosophy in All that right. one. Well, it's a long episode, but we're going to make some time for some letters. Uh, you can email us, critically acclaimed fans at gmail.com. Mm. Uh, if, uh, we can't read everyone's letter, but we try to read as many as we can, mm. and uh, we will okay. we will kind of an open book. So you just okay. talk, talk to us. So what do we got? Uh, this one comes from Lady Knight the Brave, an old oh. fan of ours. Hello, Hello. Lady Knight. Um, Lady Knight the Brave says, Hello, Bibbs and Whitney. It's good to hear you guys on films again. While I do occasionally tune in to Cancel Two soon i admit i have a preference for your film discussions and so i'm delighted to have you back in my itunes feed talking about movies we're happy to be back yay thank you sk plus uh just wanted to say i'm really glad to hear somebody liked kenneth Branagh's murder on the orient express i wanted to see it for daisy ridley and leslie odom jr and to giggle for two hours over brenna's insane mustache so i'm glad (laughs) to hear it worked for some people and wasn't a total wash also your discussion on the hollywood scandals was really thoughtful online i've been seeing a lot of posts about people being disappointed and i definitely think we need to prioritize the victim and their experiences over that disappointment. It's a breakup. It's what's going on here. Yeah. Got to break up with those people. Remember the good times, but you got to break up. Uh, and now a question. I have recently become a mentor through the Big Sisters program. Cool. My little is nine, and I wanted to introduce her to more films since it seems like her mov- movie watching has been very limited. I don't think she's seen much of the Disney catalog before the year 2000. Her favorite film right now is Suicide Squad, just for Harley Quinn looking cool, as far as I can tell, which for a nine-year-old, I can see that being um, the major takeaway of the movie, although I cried a little inside when she told me. <laughs> She seems to have a bit of a short attention span, being of this generation that mostly consumes entertainment through YouTube and the current crop of Disney shows and TV movies. Uh, one of one of which is called Bizarre Vark and is about a fictional. <laughs> A fictional YouTube with real YouTube celebrities, another called The Descendants, which is by the creators of High School Musical and is about the kids of Disney villains going to a boarding school where all the Disney hero kids go. Yay! Vomit. I've never uh, seen it. I have no idea. It sounds so bad. I've seen, I've seen the merchandise around. And they all have really obvious names like Maleficent's kid is named Mal. I get it. It's a lot to process. I've noticed she tends to like girl protagonists, if only because she relates to them more. I plan on showing her Spirited Away and Star Wars The Force Awakens. Cool. What other movies might you want to show a nine-year-old that might keep her attention and feature a girl protagonist? Uh, Lastly, I just wanted to add, I'm still figuring out your new system for all the things. I know you explained, but... I work at work, and multitasking is hard. I just wanted to say, sincerely hope for your good and bad movie feature. You one day cover Spice World and Dirty Dancing Havana Nights. We'll put them on the They're list. They're on the list, yeah. yeah. Anyway, thanks again. Want to hear you. Glad to hear you guys talking, Lady Night. Okay, uh, movies uh, for nine-year-olds. Now, whenever we recommend uh, uh, movies for kids mm-hmm. of any age, uh, we always recommend you do your research because just because I would show it to like my nieces doesn't mean yeah. you would show it to yours or or anything. So, mm-hmm. uh, but we're looking for female protagonists, movies for young mm-hmm. people. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go for the Box Trolls. The, Ooh, the, that's a fun one. The Leica film because yeah. it is disgusting. Yeah. Uh, it is. <laughs> like one of the greasiest <laughs> filthiest movies about well, a, a young boy is stolen by trolls and he lives under the streets and he teams up with a young girl who is frighteningly into morbid things yeah she's really funny <coughs> um, actually while we're on like a Coraline is another great and one Coraline, yeah. yeah Coraline's fantastic um I could go back a little further than mm. that uh, if you want to do something like fly away home oh there you which go. is a very yeah. that's that's maybe not action-packed I don't know if that's mm. important labyrinth was a is, is a great <laughs> 80s classic mm. that is so fanciful I think it's still gonna hold up really well today mm. um, let's see what we also got here uh, if you're showing her mm. spirited away you might want to consider Kiki's, Kiki's delivery, delivery service. service yeah it's yeah, a good one it's a great one or, or Hell's Moving Castle uh, that too yeah. uh, a league of their own <laughs> it's just still great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always great. We got all of League of Their Own. Uh, let's see. Uh, either version of The Parent Trap, either oh. version of Freaky Friday. Yeah. They're both yeah, pretty yeah. good. They're both pretty good. Yeah. Um, did you, the, the Adventure of Natty Gan, good one from the 80s. I actually never saw that. Yeah, Natty Gan is a good okay. one. Uh, the Wizard of Oz and Return to Oz <laughs> are both are both yeah. solid films in their own right. They're you very might, different. Yeah, you might want to sit her down. She's nine, She you know, and she hasn't seen The Wizard of Oz. She's it's seeing, time. She's seeing Suicide Squad. Mm-hmm. I think she can handle darker stuff, too, so Return <laughs> to Oz uh, qualifies. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Hidden Figures, if you think she can handle a drama, is mm-hmm. great. A lot of amazing female protagonists. It's a true story it's very inspirational it's a really good movie good Um, good kid flicks i don't know if uh uh, you're comfortable showing christmas stuff uh but i just watched prancer uh which has a great uh female protagonist as well that's a very very solid Mm. satisfying drama Mm. um i I never saw it but i've heard good things about my girl 
Um, never, never saw my girl. I liked it at the time. No, I, don't, I haven't yeah. seen it since like the nineties. That's, that's one, of, one of those ones. I think I was a little too old to see, yeah. but yeah. All right. Uh, so hopefully that gives you something to work with. But again, we always recommend uh, you do a little research, make sure there's nothing in it that you would uh, deem inappropriate, but hopefully that gives you a starting point. Yeah. There you go. Uh, what do we got okay. next? Here's a letter from Cecil. He says, I am so happy. Australia legalized marriage equality. Yay! Or they officially will from the two weeks, uh, two weeks from when I'm writing. What are your favorite weddings or parties in movies? Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, arguably the best wedding ever is uh, Princess Bride. Mowage! <laughs> Mowage is what brings us together today. Uh, you can't go wrong with much ado about nothing. Shakespeare yeah. ends with a lot of marriages. That's sure. kind of his shtick. You're thinking of the Kenneth Branagh version. Kenneth Branagh, yeah. yeah. Much ado about nothing. Um, I would actually. I've always been very, very fond of an Alan Alda movie called Betsy's Wedding, oh, there in you which go. Uh, Alan Alda accidentally gets on the hook for uh, mm-hmm. getting his daughter Molly Ringwald. Uh, an incredibly expensive wedding and everything goes off the rails and his brother-in-law played by Joe Pesci involves the mafia in planning it <laughs> and now he's like trapped in this deal with the mob and one of the mobster's sons is in love with his daughter who's a oh, cop wow it's it's, it's, it's a fun farce mm. it's, not a lot of people talk about it it's good the, I like it the, the, a lot of people don't like this gag but uh, to mention again Wet Hot American Summer uh, there's a really kind of gorgeous love story hidden in there oh, between yeah. two of the male characters uh michael ian black michael, and uh, bradley cooper yeah michael ian black and bradley cooper like i think it's bradley cooper's wandering by and all of like the the macho 80s types it takes place in the 80s it draws on a lot of the homophobia of the films that were made in the 80s oh yeah and they a start, lot of those summer camp movies they're throwing all these slurs at him and you know making fun of him because he's gay and he he retires to a shed and he, his boyfriend is there and they just like tenderly make out and they're d- deeply in love it's actually not even that dark like it seems like they're gonna go in that homophobic direction and then it turns out they're not. And it's no, no, actually no, very that's, satisfying. It, it, yeah. they, they, they subvert. The, it's like, oh, and they're making fun of him because he's gay. Well, he is, and that's actually a beautiful no, thing. They're not making fun of him because he's a virgin. Oh, You're okay. remembering it wrong. They're making fun of him because he's a virgin, and then they oh, find okay. out he's gay. And they say, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, we have to do something. Mm. And then what they do is they get him a very, they get them a very, a nice, very nice wedding, wedding gift. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's, actually, mm. it's actually pretty nice. Yeah. So, uh, But it looks like it's going in a dark direction, mm. and I appreciate that. And they subvert it. It's, yeah, it's really cleverly done. Yeah, what do we got? I like that. A lot of people don't. Another anyway. letter. Uh, this one comes from name not, not, not enclosed. Okay. Uh, hello, person. Hello. Uh, hello, Bibbs and Seibold. Critically acclaimed is the first project of yours that I've ever t- tuned into. And I have to say, it's really enjoyable, and I'm going to listen to every single episode you guys put out. Well, thank you for your commitment. Okay, thank you very really much. Appreciate that. My question is a lot more personal than most, but maybe you could answer it in a way that helps uh, helps out anyone else going through the same thing. Do you have any advice for an 18 year old who's going on to college next year and can't decide between going into film or medicine? <sighs> Ooh, Ooh, putting that on us, are you? Okay, a, two very lot. two very different career paths I feel I'm equally passionate about in different ways. Medicine seems like the safe choice, but the boring choice. It's something I'm very interested in, but it's boring in the sense that it's not as flashy as film. And it is hard. I understand that medicine is kind of hard. I, mean, I kind of hope it is, yeah. honestly. Like, I feel film, like it's... A film is equally as hard, but in a different way. Mm, in a different way. And I would call it the more fantastical and risky choice. I wouldn't want to act. My interests lie in writing and maybe even directing or being behind the camera. Thank you for taking my question. And no hard feelings if you don't. M- uh, major in medicine, <laughs> minor in film. That's an idea. Mm. Film is something that you don't need to go to school for. And I say this as someone who went to film school. Yeah. And I liked going to film school. I met my, I met my future wife in film school. <laughs> uh, so it worked out very well for me. And I'm not going to tell anyone that film school is bad. Uh, if you're torn, I will say this. It's going to be a lot harder to pursue med school later than it is to pursue film. Mm-hmm. You And in fact, you may even go to med school, learn a whole bunch of things, get a whole bunch of great life experience and find a way to turn that into something artistic and mm-hmm. be able to use that for your art. Um, you can, if you want, get your film education in your spare time. Watching movies, reading mm. books, taking online courses, playing around with cameras, making films at home. Mm. Um, we are not going to make this decision for you. That would be wildly <laughs> irresponsible. Yeah. Um, but uh, I would say you might want to consider a path that includes both. Mm. Um, and if because it, it doesn't sound like you're being forced to be a doctor because your parents want you to, like yes. in some terrible teen movie. It, it sounds like you're legitimately interested in both of these things. Yeah, you're 18. Explore what I, what you explore. Yeah. You know, also, luckily, going into college is you know when the world kind of opens up for a lot of yeah. people. And so also, be this aware, is your chance. be aware that this these are the two things you want to do now. When you're in your late twenties, you may decide you want to be a gardener. 
Like you could, yeah. <laughs> the, you could, you could get really into topiary at some point. My my dad didn't find his, his career, the th- career that would take him for his whole life until he was in his early thirties. In fact, you will find that apart from doctors and lawyers, not a lot of people went to college to major in what their career is. Yeah, um, I didn't major in film. Well, I guess I did later on, but I, yeah. I started out my college career in theater. Yeah. So uh, listen, I, I would say this. I would say this. Uh, you're at a point now where you do have to make a decision mm-hmm. and about your college, and that's really dicey, and that's really dangerous, and I, I or it really feels dangerous because you may feel like you're setting your whole path in front of you. Uh, all I will say is this. Uh, your path is not set by the decision you're making now. Mm. Your near future might be. And yeah. you're going to have to to bul- buckle down and do and, one and thing at some point, but that's you will thing. always the, the be able to do others. And the decision you make now, you will have to commit to for at least a couple of years. That's yeah. the thing. Well, and I mean, you, you, technically, I mean, technically. you could drop out if you wanted to. We're not recommending that, obviously. <laughs> Don't ever feel trapped, I guess is my point. Mm. Be- feeling trapped is a, is a great recipe for making mm. bad decisions. Yeah. This is an opportunity for you to pick something exciting. And yeah, I'm glad you're aware that it's difficult. Mm. You're going to be doing something difficult, regardless, whatever you do. Um, medicine is difficult. Every doctor I've ever known knows that it's a hard job. Yeah. The entertainment industry is really difficult just to make a living at it. Mm. Like If you end up deciding to like really pursue film instead of medicine, you're going to have a hard time finding work probably mm. for a long time. That's just the way it is. A lot of talented people mm. have difficulty like, I think it's, really succeeding. Yeah. You know, you, you'll, be lucky. You, you'll be very fortunate if you can just make a living at it. Mm. That's that's fortunate. That's that's really lucky and and successful in this industry. Mm. We hear all the major success stories, but really the majority of the people in the industry are just, just doing okay, just struggle struggling to make ends meet, just yeah. like anybody else. Yeah, exactly. Like that's the fantasy. Mm. Just make a living at it. Be comfortable. Mm. So consider your options, but also <laughs> consider that your options will be able to change at some point, and you're not locking down your entire future mm. now. Yeah. Um, so we wish you the best of luck. Let us know what you decide. <laughs> um, and uh, and, and, and if, if you go into medicine, stick with us. We can point you in the, the direction of good films to watch in the meantime. Yeah. Also, I'm a huge type of contract, so I might need your services. At some point. <laughs> so thank you very much. And seriously, good luck with mm. your life and all of your future endeavors. And, um, you know, just stay positive. I think you're going to turn out great. Sure. One more letter. Let's do one more letter. Right. Uh, this one comes from Dustin. Hello, Dustin. Hello. Hello, Bibbs and Whitney. Hi, Dustin. Hi. So glad you two are back on the air. I was a longtime listener of the B-Movies podcast. Thank you for coming back. We were longtime recorders uh, of the B-Movies podcast. <laughs> we were in every episode. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. Mike, <laughs> Almost. Not, not one together. Or one of At us least was one of us yeah. was in every episode. Okay. My question for you is this. This uh, past summer, I was asked to write movie reviews for my county newspaper as cool. they wanted to expand a few columns for a younger audience. Groovy. That's nice. Uh, at first, I was on a trial basis, but after trending on their website and receiving some good feedback, they have decided to keep me on for the foreseeable future. Also groovy. Congratulations. Yeah. This is my first time writing for a publication since I was in college six years ago, and I'm having a lot of fun sharing my knowledge and opinions with my local community. Here's my trouble. My column is only 500 words in length. <laughs> Which at times can be frustrating. It is so hard to summarize a film and critique said film in so few words. What advice do you have for me and anybody else out there who writes for a newspaper or a website? I'm sure it is common for many to have word length maximum on their columns. Happy to have you both on the Schmoes No Network and glad you are reaching a new audience. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, um, that is true. We always have a word cap. We, almost always. Almost always. We rarely just get to go on for as long as we want. And honestly, going on for as long as you want can also be a recipe for disaster. Mm. Uh, having a limited time frame... is It's kind of a blessing. If it you can th- be. If you think of brevity as an opportunity... As the soul of wit. Yeah, to, to be witty and to get to the point faster and to be a lot more concise mm-hmm. and to shore up your vocabulary in such a way that you can be dis- more descriptive with fewer words, you are becoming a better writer. Writer, sir. Yeah. Um, don't don't think of this is and this was my approach. You know, when I first started writing film reviews, I had 100 words. Ew. Then I was expanded to 450. Oh, what a blessing! 350 yeah. to 450. 450 max. You went one word over. You had to rewrite it. Um, and that was really frustrating, especially if it's a big, complex film with big ideas or some sort of philosophy, something you have a lot to say about. Uh, that's why we have this podcast. We can just go on endlessly. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, if if you can see it as a tool that forces you to be creative and you realize that you're actually learning to be concise, it, it's actually a really important tool 
uh, as a yeah. teaching mechanism. Now, I'm going to give you uh, some practical mm. advice, but all advice, the beautiful thing about advice is you don't have to take it. So <laughs> I want you to consider it, and then if it doesn't work for you, you'll figure it out. I'm sure, you, sure you'll be just fine. Uh, when working within that kind of a limitation, don't get too hung up on plot synopsis. Yeah. You really, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot, most movies do not need more than a short paragraph mm. of plot synopsis. Mm. They really don't. You just give people the gist of it. Yeah, the, the, give the, people the setup, the protagonist, their journey, why, what follows is interesting or isn't interesting, and then you're done. And then you and can a, just talk about maybe a few notable details. Yeah. And then uh, your general impression. Yeah. Just like an essay you wrote in high school, start with a general impression and with a more complex reiteration of that same impression yeah. um that's i think that's that's valuable thing to try to experiment mm-hmm. with remember just think about how you do need to give information but seriously they're going to a short review mm-hmm. they know they're not getting the whole movie yeah. try to think about like you're translating the movie for somebody there you go you know where it's like uh, not 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 the language of it but the the message of it what's the impression like of the movie just sort of in a very general way mm-hmm. really briefly so here's basically what it's about Here's why that's good or why that's bad. Maybe a few amusing observations, and then you're out. Mm. Yeah, okay, so again, play. Find an opportunity <laughs> to play. I think you're going to have a lot of fun mm. with it. Um, it's it's not it, so limited a field as you might think. It, it's really not. You can get a lot done, actually. And there's there are mm. some movies where I struggle to get the 400 words just because they're not that interesting. <laughs> so you're gonna you're gonna make be just fine, I'm sure. Mm. Um, so yeah, again, if you want to email us, uh, the email address is criticallyacclaimedfans at gmail dot com. Uh, we will be back next week mm. with a review of what do we got here? The Disaster Artist. And The Shape of Water, mm. and also uh, whatever film you vote for on the Schmilville Facebook page. And again, your options this week are, go ahead and vote, uh, Clock Stoppers, Johnny Mnemonic, Biodome, Barb Wire, and Hansel and Gretel, Warriors of Witchcraft. <laughs> uh, you can also listen to us on our other podcast, Cancelled Too Soon, which is on uh, a separate network. Uh, that's on iTunes, it's on Stitcher. Uh, this week we're reviewing Amethyst, Princess of Gem World, which was a short-lived DC Nation animated series, and we have the uh, producer and director of that series mm. on the show to talk about it that's with right. us, Miss Brianne Druhard, uh, who was awesome. So we're she, very yeah, she, she was great. She, do- cool. she doodled during the show, It was cool, and her doodles are like like better than something I could draw if I put my mind to it. You yeah, know? Whitney, Whitney fancies himself an artist too, so that's saying something. It's pretty cool. Kind of. <laughs> well, you're better than me. Um, so, uh, so that's cool as well. You can check that out, and um, yeah, and don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Schmoes No Network. You can uh, listen to them in audio form on iTunes. You can also go to SK Plus on YouTube uh, if that's your preferred way to mm. listen. We're not in video form there, but you can just click on it and listen to us there. And um, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all, everywhere you can find us. Yeah. Oh, I'm on Twitter at William Bibiani. I'm at Whitney Seibel. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. So thank you everybody for listening. We'll see you next week. And never forget, everyone's a critic. I want to go to the midnight show. I'm sorry, what? <laughs>